Hello everybody, uh, welcome to um, this uh, next up in the in the kind of line of series of uh, conferences from Hedgehog Friendly Campus. This um, is a really exciting one, one I've been really looking forward to. I'm going to be learning a little bit about rats and coexisting with um, with rats on our campuses. Um, we are due to get started um, in just a few minutes, um, so if you can bear with me while uh, we wait for our final speaker. Um, and in the meantime, if you want to check out some of the links hashtags um, and uh, social media handles on the screen and that'd be great. You can get us at Hog Friendly um, and please do give uh, the British Hedgehog Preservation Society a follow as well at Hedgehog Society and we'll get started in just two minutes. Fantastic. I think we've got everybody now, so we will get started. Um, so uh, big thanks again for joining. Today's um, conference series of talks is all about rats. <laughs> so perhaps not what you'd expected to be doing with your Thursday uh, Thursday afternoon, but we'll, we will be talking um, about a number of aspects to do with rat behaviour, ecology, um, methods of control on our campuses and beyond, and how um, rodenticides or, or uh, rat, um, rat poisons might be impacting on, on hedgehogs. Um, so it might seem like a little bit of a, um, a strange uh, discussion to be having for hedgehog friendly um, enthusiasts, um, but we'll learn a little bit more as we go through about why um, why we think this might be an important aspect of uh, your campaigns and of the way that our campuses are managed. So the aim for today um, is to really help us all understand how we can safely manage our relationship with rodents um, without harming our um, our crucial wildlife. Um, a little bit of housekeeping for the session today. We are recording this session um, and we will be able to share the recording with you after today if you've registered via Eventbrite and we will be sending out the, uh, the link to you there. Um, just a request to please keep your microphones and, um, and cameras switched off um, unless you're uh, somebody that's speaking in which case you can of course switch them on um, when you are speaking. This is a little bit of a um, perhaps possibly political um, topic and slightly divisive. So I would please ask everybody remain kind and considerate and understanding of other people's opinions as we move through the talks today. Um, but I do very much, and we all do very much encourage questions from, um, from the group. So if you do have questions for any of the speakers today, please use the chat box for these. There will be time for speakers to address these in between, um, in between talks. Uh, for those of you that haven't used Zoom before, um, you will be able to find the chat box towards the bottom of your um, screen if, you're, if you've logged on with a, um, a computer. Um, and I'm just going to pop a quick message into the chat box there for you and um, that should just bounce a little notification over to you. Um, so please use that chat box to just say hello and introduce yourselves, be interested to know where you're tuning in from and of course if you have any questions please pop them in there as well. Um, there will be short comfort breaks between our talks so that you can go and, and grab a drink, um, so don't worry. Um, and we're due to close at 4pm. If you can't stay for the whole session, um, then please just let us know in the chat box. Um, and as I said, we will be sharing the, the recording with you after today. So that's the housekeeping. Hedgehog Friendly Campus, for anybody that's joined us that isn't aware of this campaign, uh, it's a really fantastic programme um, that's funded by the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. That's all about making positive changes for hedgehogs on and around campus. There are three aspects to the campaign um, that teams of, st of staff and students work towards achieving um, on and around their campuses. The first being protecting hedgehogs from harm. Uh, hedgehogs face quite a lot of hazards unfortunately they are now vulnerable to extinction in Britain 
um, enhancing habitats on and around campus for hedgehogs, um, but also educating staff and students and as well as the public on ways that they might be able to, um, to help hedgehogs. So that's what Hedgehog Friendly Campus is all about. It is an awards scheme, actually. So our campuses are working towards uh, bronze, silver and gold level awards. It's a fantastic um, programme that I think everybody is, that's involved really enjoys it. Um, and for anybody that's joined that isn't involved in the programme, um, I'll be happy to share some more information with you after today. Um, just got a quick video to show you uh, that explains a little bit more about what the programme's all about. It's very sweet um, and animated. Uh, so I'll give you a chance to watch that now. Hedgehog Friendly Campus is a new project that aims to turn your university campus into a place where hedgehogs can thrive. Did you know that hedgehog numbers in the UK have declined by up to half since the year 2000? It's now estimated that there are fewer than one million left. Because of things like roads, litter and a lack of food, water and natural habitat, the world can be a dangerous place for hedgehogs. So why universities? Well, they actually take up quite a lot of land. Our mission, with your help, is to make sure this space is suitable and safe for hedgehogs. What does a hedgehog-friendly campus look like? Staff and students pull together to ensure their campus is litter-free. With joined up habitat. Plenty of opportunity to eat and drink. And hedgehog houses to keep them safe and dry. These are just some of the things we can all do to help get hedgehogs back up to healthy numbers. It's free to take part, and if helping hedgehogs isn't enough, your university could also get hedgehog-friendly campus accreditation. If you're a staff member or student and want to make your campus hedgehog-friendly, contact us today to get the ball rolling. So if that's um, struck a chord with anybody and you would like uh, some more information, please do drop us an email, info at hedgehogfriendlycampus.co.uk um, to get involved on your campus. Um, so today um, we're all about rats <laughs> uh, and we have a number of really interesting speakers from uh, lots of different places for you today. Um, first up, we've got David, David Wembridge from the People's Trust for Endangered Species, a charity that works um, quite closely with the British Hedgehog Preservation Society on its campaign called Hedgehog Street. David, however, um, works on uh, different projects um, within the People's Trust and uh, does a lot to raise awareness of mammals. Um, and so first up is, is, is David. David's going to be talking to us on about um, rats and uh, his um, lovely presentation, More to Rats Than Myths. Um, so David is, is first up there. We're due to finish that first talk at about half past one, um, at which point there'll be a chance for some questions and a quick comfort break. Um, straight up afterwards, we have Dr. Alan Buckle from the University of Reading. Um, Alan is here to speak to us about some of the, um, the cold hard facts of rodenticides, the uses, efficacy and impacts of, of these rodenticides and uh, really interested to hear what Alan has to, um, has to say there. Um, and that's due um, to finish around half past two, so for anybody um, that needs to, um, to plan in breaks, that's when we're due to, um, to finish there. There'll be a chance for questions again between each of these and short comfort break. And then we have Emily um, up third. Emily, uh, Emily Williams from the University of Lincoln, a master's student who um, has been doing research into rodenticides at the University of Lincoln. Uh, and Emily's talk, do rodenticides commonly pose, um, uh, commonly used in the UK pose a threat to European hedgehogs and the, the hedgehogs that we have here in the, in the wild in the UK. Um, and then uh, up last, uh, we have a talk from um, Kevin. Um, Kevin Newell from um, uh, the uh, Humane Wildlife Solutions um, uh, uh, business and Kevin's going to be talking to us about the non-lethal approach to rat conflicts and that's the last talk um, for um, for the session today due to finish at about um, quarter to four and there should be time just to wrap up at the end um, with a few final questions um, so that's the the plan that's the order for today um, and um, we hope you're really going to going to enjoy it um, so um, first up we've got David David um, is a uh, um, a, um, as mentioned earlier, David is a, a staff member at the People's Trust for Endangered Species. David is the Mammal Surveys Coordinator there. And David runs the Living with Mammals Survey that collects records of mammals in the built environment with the aim to identify how populations change over time and how we can encourage biodiversity in our towns and cities. 
Um, so over to you, David, if you would like to go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Current. Okay, is that visible? We've so, got, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, so much, David. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joe, for uh, the invitation to speak today. Um, I very much think the Support Act Warm Up Act um, for today. And really, we'll do a bit of flag waving for rats, I think. Um, they seem to get a, a very bad press and genu yeah, generally, I don't think, uh, kind of a fairly treated, really. Um, so really, the, the point of this talk is, is to kind of readdress the balance a little and, and to put them into a bigger context. The working title of this talk was Rats, you probably don't need to worry about them. Um, and by that, I don't, don't mean to suggest we should be complacent um, about them. Uh, just that if you encounter a rat, in almost all cases, um, most of the time, it's not a problem. Um, if you see a rat, it doesn't indicate that there's a problem. It doesn't indicate that we should employ um, sort of control measures. <clears throat> really, you know, that's, you know, if there is a genuine problem, yeah, we may need to do that. And, and there can be problems. Um, rats uh, i think if you're a large number of rats in a small area then yes there are can be and you know probably are problems they can certainly damage property and, and uh, eat um, stored food products um they, they can be a, a disease risk as well um so there are issues um but i would i would hope personally as a personal view that, that um we turn to sort of control measures less frequently in the future and, and we look more benignly upon rats really um, and just see them as part of an integral part of our biodiversity um, uh, in the country um, so so i will sort of try and dispel a few of the myths misconceptions prejudices that people have against rats but i won't talk so much about the, the other side of it you know more of a natural history more of a extraordinary um, creatures that they are um, it's well worth sort of reading up on, on rats if, if you want to <clears throat> rats get a very bad press though um and you have to look very far to find it this was uh, a headline uh, in express earlier this year in september um highlight is bigger and braver giant rats invading british homes through toilets uh, rats will mug you on the street they'll invade your home and uh terrifyingly it, it's always through the toilet i think that plays on some very deep uh subconscious fear i think when we're almost vulnerable um <clears throat> this story was also uh, in Jim Sun in the Independent, the, uh, the Mirror, the Standard. I think it's had very wide coverage, um, and such stories are perennial. If you go back uh, to 2020, there was an article in the Sun, print overrun by thousands of giant rats and knocked down uh, as rodents invade homes and cars uh, and even eat each other. So it's quite a terrifying situation. Um, but I don't think. A lot of these stories are entirely accurate. Um, they give a false picture of rats, I think, and one which isn't helpful. I mean, it's it's a uh, um, it, it it's a skewed picture. It plays on people's fears a little, and it is, just isn't a good thing. If you dig, I mean, if you read these stories, there isn't very much to them. And I would bet that the origin of these stories, uh, which turn up each year, is almost always a press release from uh, a pest control organization just reminding people that rats can be a problem um but uh, kind of they make good stories and the press pick them up but really isn't very much to them um there was a story uh in liverpool echo also uh, last year <clears throat> about rats which had returned to an area um i think they'd, they'd, they'd been an infestation in august and by december they were back and they'd interviewed residents I said, rats are back, this time they seem to be immune to poison, brazen creatures, um, can't be stopped. They're absolutely huge, like rabbits. I mean, everything, including each other. Um, it, it's, I think it's just a little sort of um, uh, overtop, really, when, when, when talking about rats. And as I say, a lot of these stories do kind of originate just from pest control agencies, just reminding people. Um, and they can be a problem, yep, that's fine. But um, most of the time, they're not. One of the commonest uh, 
ideas about rats is that you're never more than six feet away from a rat, which is it's sort of an odd uh, statistic in many ways. You don't really think about any other species in that way. Uh, and I don't think it's true. <clears throat> um, uh, and for the local WhatsApp group, very recently, at the end of the summer of this year, which was sort of for the, for the street um, that I live on, uh, someone posted up, or someone posted, uh, oh, I've just seen a rat. You know what I say? You're never more than three feet away from a rat. Um, and it's just just an odd thing to sort of consider. Really. It, it's, I mean, three feet, is, apart from the absurd, absurdity of that, is um, just kind of an odd thing to say. The only other animals I think mentioned in the group have been hedgehogs. Um, and red kites, both very positively. Um, no other animals really get mentioned, but rats. See rat, my goodness, there must be a problem. Um, I don't think it's true. Are we being overrun by rats? How many rats are there? Um, at this point, I've got a small detour just to mention rats. So I'm talking about our brown rats, <coughs> Ratus norvegicus, uh, the Norway rat or brown or um, common rat. Um, we don't have an enormous number of mammals in this country. About a quarter of them, 15 species, are rodents. Uh, and most of those are murity, mice and rats. We have two rat species, um, the brown rat uh, and the black rat, ratus ratus. Uh, although I would argue that black rat is probably extinct now in Britain. Um, uh, and I'll mention that later, but brown rat is um, lovely and coat color, <clears throat> although sort of brown rats tend to be a, a grayish brown, coat color isn't a very good indication of uh, the species, whether it's brown or black. Um, brown rats can be quite dark and appear black, and black rats can appear quite brown. So that uh, in it itself isn't uh, a good indication. But brown rats are larger, we're about 10 or 11 inches head body length, um, up to about 28 centimeters. Uh, the tail is a little less uh, than the body length. It's used for balance. Um, they're excellent swimmers, both on the surface and underwater. Very good climbers. Um, they uh, are social animals. We live in, in, in groups, and grooming is a very important social behaviour. In sort of rural areas, uh, farmland and, and in, around farm buildings, you can get colonies of several hundred animals. But in domestic uh, buildings, residential areas, groups are much, much smaller. Um, and in sort of well-fed small groups, uh, rats are meticulous groomers, um, both of themselves and each other, keep very clean. Um, when we get crowded and numbers get a bit higher, then that, that sort of becomes less frequent. Uh, they become slightly more antagonistic towards each other as well and scuffles break out. <clears throat> so that sort of very crowded environment for rats isn't ideal for rats and, and um, that's what we're looking for. Um, the, I mean, if you see a rat, it will be a brown rat. Um, I'd say black rats, or both, both are introduced species. So uh, black rats were introduced in Roman times, brown rats uh, in probably the 1700s on uh, sort of trade vessel shipping, uh, and probably from Russia, brown rats probably came from Russia. Um, they, they sort of, over that period then sort of displaced black rats. Black rats are slightly less uh, tolerant of coldish conditions and sort of temperate climate and are almost always exclusively associated with um, buildings. Uh, brown rats are associated with buildings, but also in more open areas. Um, and black rats kind of were, were just pushed out as housing changed. Um, and really the sort of last remaining sort of populations of the 20th century were in ports. Uh, certainly in the 1940s in London, uh, there were numerous black rats, um, possibly as many sort of buildings had black rats as had brown rats. But really, and they would hang around sort of docks and, well, not hang around. <laughs> Sorry, not the uh, correct uh, expression really, but they would, um, uh, they yeah, sort of localised to docks where partly eight sort of new um, arrivals would um, come into a population, but also populations had that uh, sort of a, the uh, warehouses for structures that were very suited to them. And there was a lot of um, food as well being stored or, or unloaded and so forth. Um, the kind of nail in the coffin for black rats was containerization in shipping and the loss of those sorts of habitats around docks, uh, the loss of warehouses and so forth. And um, they're more or less um, confined to islands really in, in Britain 
uh, on Lundy in, in, in the uh, Bristol Channel uh, and Shant in, in the Hebrides. Um, Shant was probably the last permanent population. Both of those populations right, on Lundy and on Shant were eradicated um, um, to protect seabird colonies. Um, so there probably aren't any permanent sort of colonies of, of black rats left in Britain, and I would suggest them probably um, extinct now in this country. Um, although we do certainly predate um, have very, sort of very broad ranging diets, <clears throat> lead to almost anything, um, and will predate uh, bird eggs. So they, they do, and certainly on islands particularly, I mean, rats can be a problem um, for other species and if, if rats have been introduced, then uh, you, you can get very uh, sort of serious um, problems arise. I don't know whether there was actually, although we certainly were predating birds eggs, whether there was much research into the effect of that at the population level for seabirds and whether that actually was um, threatening uh, populations of seabirds. But it was relatively easy to just eradicate this and, and lose a um, one of our mammal species. And I would suggest that that probably would, sort of a, that needed greater consideration, I think. Um, not to say you know, that it wasn't uh, an appropriate thing to do necessarily, but it seemed to be done with very little consideration, the fact that you're eliminating um, a British mammal. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, so if you see a rat, uh, just on likelihood really, it will be a brown rat. Um, so how many brown rats are there? Um, there was an, an article uh, in The Guardian earlier this year, uh, and again, which, which sort of gives away its origins by actually quotes this pest.co.uk company. Warns that the British rat population uh, has been by 25% a quarter uh, in 2020, bringing the total up to 150 million. I don't know where these numbers came from, um, it's very difficult to sort of uh, monitor and, and um, identify some trends in, in mammals populations nationally. Um, so I don't know where 25% came from, and I suspect that both, in fact, were plucked from thin air. Um, I don't think there are anything like as many rats. <clears throat> There's probably about a 20th of that in fact. The most uh, recent estimate was in 2018 by um, uh, well, in, in a, a review of British mammals that was commissioned by the uh, Mammal Society, uh, a group of academics looked at all British species, or, or um, yeah, all British mammal species, and tried to identify uh, population sizes, trends, and what we could about status. It is, so it's about 7 million, sorry, I should have said, um, is the estimate, just over 7 million brown rats. It is a very uncertain figure however it's very difficult to estimate national um, population sizes for mammals uh, you more or less have to try and find the densities estimate the density of rats in different habitats look at the extent of the habitat across the country whether that's urban habitats woodland farmland so forth um, and try and estimate the occupancy um, what proportion of the habitat is occupied by the species and all of that is fairly uh, guessworky. <clears throat> so there is a lot of uncertainty to this figure. But I would suggest it's it's a much better guess than 150 million, which would outnumber you know, other estimates of other, other things like would mice and bank rolls and smaller things which which must be much, much more numerous. So I think seven million probably isn't far off the truth. Um so does does that mean we're we're only ever six feet away from a rat? No. Um if you look at sort of the urban area, urban area in Britain is about 25,000 square kilometres. If all of the rat population, 7 million, were in that, um, in, in urban areas, so there were no rural rats, which isn't the case. We know there are rural populations, but if there were 7 million, we don't know how accurate 7 million is. Maybe it's, you know, maybe there are 7 million in urban areas. Then that's roughly one rat every, uh, sorry, two, 280 rats every square kilometre, or about one rat every 60 metres, um, which I think is, is perhaps much more of a realistic figure and, and even then you, you do wonder what um what it really means you don't really talk about that for any other species um <clears throat> the idea of rats being only, only ever six feet away from a rat sort of plays on the idea that they're just around the corner waiting to pounce on you but they're not um 
you, know, you, you will encounter them, but not that frequently in my experience. Um, interestingly, um, there's another estimate a few years ago, which appeared in um, British Wildlife um, by Dave Cohen uh, from the Food and Environment Research Agency, um, who estimated a figure of about 50 meters. And I suspect, although I don't know, but I suspect with similar reasoning, um, of a population estimate and then the amount of urban space. About 80% of the human population live in urban areas, <clears throat> so most of us are going to encounter wildlife and rats in urban areas. Um, so that seemed fair. Um, that assumes that rats are kind of evenly spaced. Um, they're not, they're going to be in social groups, as I said, and so you might expect a slightly large distance. Um, so very roughly, uh, for what worth such a such an odd statistic is, um, I would say, yeah, you know, more than 50 to 100 meters from a rat um, on average, which is which, whatever that means, um, is a strange thing. So, so nothing really terribly concerning, I would have said. <clears throat> um, but are they invading our homes and indeed our cars, as was reported in the Sun? Well, um, it's it's difficult. I mean, I suppose to to know how how. Um, uh, Sort of yeah that, that sort of frequency in in, in urban um, residential areas is um, one way of doing it is to employ cats to go out and catch mammals for you um, there was a study a few years ago which looked at predation by domestic cats um, it was something like a uh, close to something a thousand cats in 600 odd households and over a period I can't remember what period it was but it, it was quite a I think more or less a year, I think. Um, they brought in 14,000, just over 14,000 prey items, 162, about just over 1% were rats. <clears throat> um, doesn't seem very high about, this is everything. So this, this includes mammal, bird, uh, invertebrate species, reptiles, anything else, anything that, that the cats were catching. Um, I think about 20 mammal species were recorded. Um, it doesn't suggest that rats are that common, but then rats are probably avoid, or not or at least, you know, not, caught by cats um, because an adult rat is quite a um, quite an opponent I think um, we probably catch juvenile rats more often but I would expect most cats avoid um, rats or at least you know, encounter or trying to to catch them um, saying that uh, a colleague at work has two cats and they regularly catch adult um, rats. Uh, he lives, in his words, a moderate, in a, moderate, a moderately grotty area of Reading, uh, but one I think with fairly typical suburban gardens. Uh, over the summer, he estimates, it's kind of only anecdotal, but he estimates his cats catch a rat every one to two weeks over some period, which suggests they're fairly common in those sorts of environments, or at least not uncommon, perhaps. Um, it's it's but that's yeah but uh, it, that's quite a sort of a a subjective view. A, a, a better way of looking at it is to look at um, <clears throat> or to look at the results of something called the English House the Condition Survey. Um, this is a big survey of housing and and um, across the country residential housing um, and lots of aspects of it. And one aspect is whether there are rodent infestations. Um, uh, started in 1996 I and mean, then was repeated five years later and I think since then it's more or less um, sort of been carried out on an annual rolling basis. Um, I, can only, I could find data up to 2007, I think a, pub, a paper was published in, in 2017 but looked at the first 15 years of the survey, so up to about 2010. Um, and I'll give reference if anyone likes that and, and that looked at um, changes in rat and mouse um, uh, uh, sort of percentages of properties with those uh, where they were found. It's carried out by um, environmental health officers and sort of building professionals who are trying to recognize signs of rats. So they'll look for uh, runs or, or um, uh, droppings. Um, I, I very rarely would see rats both inside properties and outside. These are um, occupied, so inhabited properties um it doesn't, doesn't so it doesn't include vacant properties doesn't include commercial properties i don't think um or some some types of um uh flats and, and so forth but most occupied buildings uh, and you can see that, that um the proportion of houses 
with rats inside, uh, was about 0.4%. So four in a, in a thousand properties might have rats inside. Outside in the gardens, um, uh, slightly higher, sort of one seven percent, three percent in 27. I think that sort of a, in, in a paper published up to sort of looking at the data up to 2010, I think sort of they found 2007, 2008 was a bit of a peak. And it dropped slightly from men, from there. But it it would be, I think, probably fair to say that maybe two, three percent of buildings would have rats in sort of surrounding area of the gardens and so forth, which, yeah, I mean, you, you can take from that what you will. That seems about right to me. Um, and, and not particularly high for for a sort of a, a you know a large rodent. Um, so um, that's in sort of buildings. Um, also, a, a paper published a little well after the first survey. Um, also, you can say that rats were more prevalent or found more often in low density or older housing. That's probably because mature gardens possibly bigger mature gardens are just more suitable habitats for rats. Um, they were also more prevalent uh, in properties where pets or livestock were kept in the garden um, and also where there's lots of litter. Um, so you can see there's sort of things which will encourage rats uh, and there are activities which will encourage rats. So one of the easiest way to discourage rats is um, not to leave litter around um, and certainly sort of um, perhaps you know, just keep tidier uh, properties. Um, oh. um, you can also so that that was so that was a, a, um, a survey of property. I think it's something like uh, ten thousand properties. A sample size about ten thousand, uh, and it's random. Um, but another it's a, another way of looking at it is. Um, to actually ask people what they or whether they see rats in the garden. And one of the things that, that PTS do is run a, a survey called Living with Mammals, which records mammals in the built environment. In urban green spaces, predominantly about 70% about of sites are gardens, domestic gardens, but also um, uh, sort of local parks, allotments, uh, cemeteries, um, university campuses and the like are all surveyed as well. Um, <clears throat> So quite a, so a range of green spaces through the built environment. It's not random. So this is a, these are self-selected sites. And so they're, they're probably sites which are probably better for wildlife or uh, support more wildlife than uh, a typical or average site. Um, and, that, and just seeing the wildlife is going to prompt people to want to do the survey. And if you don't see wildlife, you're not going to sort of want to do the survey. So in this respect, this survey is probably um, going to produce a higher estimate or, or, or at the top end of, of, uh, of the range. Um, so if you ask people to, to record mammals, and, and both sightings and signs, um, and uh, for most of the time this has been running, this has been running for a few years now, um, it's been run through the spring. <clears throat> so these are spring records uh, in April, May and June. This year we've, we've actually run the survey um, continually throughout the year still going on and if you'd like to take part please do uh, it doesn't take much effort at all it's just a little time each week uh, telling us what you see really um if you ask people um what we see about 20 percent uh report rats <clears throat> from either sightings or signs um which sounds quite a lot um it's half as many as report hedgehogs um it can be a little bit higher. In some years, it's 24, 25 percent. Uh, recently, in 2019 and 2020, it was 16 percent. Um, so you can take that from you know somewhere between um, sort of three and 15 percent, and I would say close to three percent perhaps of properties have rats in their garden. Um, it, it's difficult to know sure, but I would I would hazard a guess at say around between five and 10 percent perhaps. <clears throat> Um, uh, more, more sort of interesting. Well, how, how you know, are, are these figures changing? Um, and you can look at the underlying trend um, underlying these. Uh, and if we do that, uh, we get a graph. And so this tries. To, so so this um, shows solid 
wavy line is the smooth trend based on the proportion of sites uh, that report the presence of rats, either from sightings or signs. So it's presence absence data. Um, it uh, will, uh, so it's what does it take, takes into account changes from year to year um, in the proportion of sites which might be gardens or proportion of sites which are you know, uh, playing fields and the like. It takes into account changes in <clears throat> or differences in uh, recording effort, how long people have looked for, the time of day that people look. So it tries to um, uh, take that one into account and estimate the population based on that. And for convenience, that's, that's done relative to a baseline year. And for statistical reasons, that's taken as 2004 in this case. Um, so that's, that's taken to be 100. And then each year is estimated um, relative to that. Um, and you can see that really for the first 10 years, it didn't really change much at all. The SOD line is, is the trend, then the dashed lines are 95% confidence intervals. And then the crosses show estimates um, for each individual year, um, annual estimates. <clears throat> but it really doesn't change very much for the first 10 years. In the last 10 years, since about 2013, um, it has shown increase. Uh, it's statistically significant. Uh, it's about 30% increase. Um, so it looks like population might be increasing. Um, certainly at the sorts of sites in the survey. <clears throat> Whether that's um, significant, uh, so practically, or any, or any in terms of our interactions with rats, I don't know, and I wouldn't think there was any reason to think it, it was, really. Um, I, I don't think that's affected very much. Um, you'd hope that reflects an increase in um, how well individual sites and also at a large scale, neighborhood scale, sort of a, a level of towns and, and cities, how well they support biodiversity. And perhaps we're making uh, where we live more biodiverse uh, and greener places. Um, but certainly I wouldn't suggest that's anything that indicates a problem. Um, but it might indicate that rat numbers are increasing. They might well they go down again in a few years, who knows, but um, that's the latest thing. I wouldn't have said it's a problem though. Um, are we invading our cars? <clears throat> Short answer is I don't know, I doubt it. Um, certainly uh, gray squirrels have been, uh, there have been reports of gray squirrels hoarding uh, or caching to nut hordes in um, cars. On continent of Europe, stone martins can be a problem in urban areas. Um, they often <coughs> will, will nest in cars and, and attract as warm sort of engine casings and the like, and can, and can cause damage. Um, but in Britain, I really don't know of any reports to suggest um, rats are a problem in cars. So I wouldn't worry about that. They're not gonna hot wire your car. Um, the other aspect, I suppose, is um, disease. <clears throat> do rats spread disease? The answer is yes, they do. Uh, they spread a number of zoonotic diseases. That is, diseases that um, the animals carry and can infect humans. Um, but then again, a lot of wild and domestic animals do. And I would argue the risk is small. Um, and, and, and I would argue that the benefits so rats in the environment possibly out or, or do outweigh that small risk. <clears throat> um, it's a thing which goes back a long time, and, and rats are um, uh, kind of seen as plague carriers, and that goes right back to the Black Death. Um, but arrived, the Black Death have arrived in Mediterranean Europe, and then shortly afterwards in Britain um, in the mid 14th century. Um, it persisted in Europe for a long time actually, until about the early 1800s. Um, and and black and yeah, blacks and sorry, we um it would have been black rats then, but but rats are blamed for you know, the worst catastrophe in recorded history. It's been described as um, something like a third of the European human population were killed by it. it completely changed um, society and social and economic structures and things, and a huge effect. And rats get the blame. Oh, it's rats. Um, but in fairness, uh, there's some research suggesting that gerbils might have 
been more responsible for the outbreaks uh, in Europe. And um, the spread of disease, I mean, it's transmitted, tends to be transmitted by flea bites. Um, and although fleas tend to stick to their host species, if they can, um, if they're pushed, so to speak, uh, they will go on to other animals and you get, bit, get bitten by a, by a cat's fleas and so forth. Um, and, and that will transmit disease. But in fact, probably the spread of disease, uh, recent um, work shows it was probably down to human fleas and lice. Uh, and that's what really spread the um, disease around Europe. So blaming black rat, uh, or rats generally for um, uh, for the plague is a little unfair. They really, I mean, they're, they're yes, they're certainly involved. Um, plague is plague, which is a bacterial infection, is a zoonotic, zoonotic disease of wild rodents. Um, a very part of it, and to be honest, most of it was probably, uh, I'd say, human fleas and lice and gerbils. I blame the gerbils. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the plague today, or, or to be honest, plague is very rare. There are still some instances around, around the world, um, but it's very uncommon. Today, really, the concern is um, viral disease from rats, leptospirosis. Um, it's leptospirosis is, is carried in the, or transmitted by the urine of um, rats, but also by the other animals, including mice, um, cattle, pigs will transmit it. And um, it's caught if the urine, um, infected urine, contaminates a, usually it's a, a natural water, um, a, sort of a, a water source, um, such as a river or a lake. <coughs> um, uh, and, and it can be contracted. It's comparatively, you know, rare though. I mean, I think there are about 50 cases uh, in the UK each year, and some of those will be contracted abroad when people come back to the UK and then develop symptoms. Um, it is very, it's a very nasty disease. Um, it can be fatal. Um, it's very unpleasant. But um, I would argue if you're aware of a risk and you're aware particularly of symptoms, then that's a acceptable and manageable risk. I know people, I mean, some people disagree and that's, you know, I think it is an area, but it's about balancing you know, individual perceptions of risk and benefit and so forth. And but I would argue that it, it's comparatively rare, given the popularity of open water swimming, of uh, sailing, kayaking, whatever, um, around, around sort of water bodies, it's comparatively rare and it's not a big risk. And, and I say lots of other animals do um, carry diseases. So rats will um, carry rabies, something like one in a hundred rats, about 1% or something like that, um, carry rabies. You don't encounter rats particularly often. Um, you need a license to handle bats certainly, but occasionally uh, my cats have brought in a, a bat and I've had to take it outside again. If I'm aware of a risk with the carrier's rabies, I can put gloves on and that's fine. You can take it outside at very low risk. And I would argue that um, I think we're better off sort of with an environment that supports rats and with rats in the environment than removing rats from the environment to reduce that risk entirely. Um, but I appreciate you know, that's that's one view and there are other views as well. Um, I uh, say so, yes. So, I mean, and you might say, well, <clears throat> all right, okay. So you can catch things from animals, and things from domestic animals, from cats and dogs. Uh, but there are benefits to keeping pets, companion animals. Um, you know, and I think those benefits outweigh the risks. What are the benefits of wild rats? Um, I, th I think there are benefits to wild rats. If you care about biodiversity then you benefit from rats that add to that biodiversity. Um, we, we, we live in, a, in one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. Um, a recent report showing we're in the bottom 10% of countries. <clears throat> we have very few, I mean, generally just very few um, mammal species um, compared to continental Europe. We're, we're sort of an archipelago stuck on the edge and we've, we've you know, lost a lot of mammal species <clears throat> that haven't been, um, uh, um, we haven't then got them back because we're, we're stuck on an island. So really, a uh, naturalized species like rats, well, maybe we should hang on to them as long as we can, um, or at least not see them in quite such a menacing way. Um, 
the whole point of this really is 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 to uh, kind of readdress the balance slightly. Um, they are wonderfully intelligent animals as well, and uh, I mean, it, it's worth mentioning. I mean, rats. I mean, they're archetypal sort of problem solvers in um, laboratory mazes. Uh, in laboratory research, they they've been used for a long time to solve puzzles, to look at intelligence, and learning, and so forth. <clears throat> and actually, um, recently they've been shown uh, rats know when they don't know the answer to something. Uh, and that sort of um, thinking about mental processes, metacognition, um, has only been described in primates before. So we are we are obviously quite smart. Um, and although they're, um, yeah, they're just little, little rats. I mean, if you've ever kept fancy rats, you'll know that um, they've got sophisticated enough brains to have personalities, uh, <coughs> individual personalities. Um, they might be bolder uh, or more timid. Um, they'll particularly have uh, you know, preferences on what way they gnaw. <coughs> um, <coughs> as a student, I, ke I kept rats, a number of rats. And if you imagine a very messy student room, um, lots of stuff strewn on the floor. Um, they'd, they'd run around the floor and some rats would, one rat would um, only gnaw books. Um, pretty much or occasionally the, the sort of uh, wooden legs of chairs and things, but predominantly books. Another rat would only eat um, pen tops and burrows and sort of plastic things and very much thing. They'd be very different in their sociability and how social way with me with others so even something as simple as a rat has personality has an intelligence uh it's an extraordinary creature it's incredibly adaptable and um, they have followed people around everywhere across the world um and i would just say we're not, probably not invading our homes they're certainly not invading our cars there is a risk certainly uh, making damaged property and spread disease <clears throat> but those sorts of things can be managed and generally i think it's probably a better idea not to not to worry about them unless there is a genuine problem and, and there might be but we don't worry about lots of things we don't worry about gray squirrels or wood mice or anything else um they're just there in the environment until maybe we have a problem with them and then we can sort it out but until we do um i would argue that rats you probably don't have to worry about them uh, and that's that's it thank you let me stop sharing fascinating thank you david and um, there's been lots of chat and questions in the chat box. So hopefully we can spend a little bit of time addressing those. If I can just kick things off. I was fascinated to learn that cats don't really eat rats. That's really surprising. Well, certainly on a, a, a fairly low level. Um, well, they don't catch them or at least bring them in as, as caught prey. And I, I think it's just because they are quite a formidable it's... opponent. Um... Yeah. Yeah. They're a fair size. They're not as big as rabbits or, or cats, indeed, but they are, you know, yeah, they would put up a fight, I think. They would put up a fight. Yeah. So what species are eating rats in the wild and um, that we foxes. know of? And is it having any kind of impacts on the population? Yeah, well, I, suppose, I mean, foxes will, will catch rats. I mean, they're prey for uh, raptors as well. Um, and again, that's part of very ecological sort of values. They are prey for uh, you know, a lot of other predators uh, and uh or raptors so yeah i mean that, that that's a value I, as far as i know there's no no indication that i mean as i say uh, it's very difficult to get um a good idea of how um populations large scale national scale are changing our populations um there's insufficient evidence i think to to know really to have any idea of how the national population is changing certainly in abundance um the range is probably stable um so there's no changes there and i would suspect that <clears throat> you know rats are here and, and their predation isn't isn't having a big impact or at least it's not um causing a change in population long-term change great thanks david we've got a question from um Anne marie on the chat box do compost bins or heaps actually attract rats so Anne marie's heard people say that but she's not she's not entirely sure what, what what's your take on that david I would say yes, they probably do, yes. Uh, if only because they're attracting other little things as well. Um, and I'd say that they, they have very wide, um, very broad diets, um, and it, which includes invertebrates and uh, and fruits, uh, say birds' eggs, anything really they can get their hands on. And compost heaps would be a good source of food. They're going to attract them and might well attract other things they, they would feed on as well. So yes, really. Uh, and if there's anybody that's concerned, is there anything that you could recommend with a compost bin, perhaps? 
um instead of having an exposed pile or something yeah i mean that's really yeah the way to go i suppose is have it much yeah is to enclose it more um it, it's difficult to exclude them entirely <clears throat> um and i suspect the other i mean uh yeah, the other following talks might might well discuss this a little bit more. But yeah, I mean, it is able to exclude them. As I say, I mean, they're very exceptionally sort of um, uh, what's what I mean? they're, they're very agile climbers. They will, I think, they're very good swimmers. They're very good at getting in most places. Um, I mean, and, and they, they do. Free, and gardens are good habitats for rats. So, a good mature garden which attracts biodiversity um, is. And it's accessible. It's open. It's probably going to attract rats as well. Um, yes, and and yeah, you, you have to decide then what 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 um, what to do. Um, as I say, I wouldn't have thought though the odd rat at a reasonable sort of number of visiting the garden is a problem. And that, that's not. I think people over or can overact. A lot of the public might. Um, just, just be fearful of rats, and just think. Well, if I see a rat, that means that I've got to get rid of it, and we'll, we'll. And, but that's not really the case. I think there, are, there are certainly, um, you know, issues and concerns with lethal pest control that the other talks can discuss uh, you know, in much more detail. Um, and I would just hope that yeah, you know, we, we we don't turn to that as frequently, and 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 sort of don't leap to the conclusion that they're a problem. <clears throat> they may well be. I mean, I'm not not denying that at all. I mean, they can be a problem, but I think. Yeah, you know, see the problem first, and then consider it. You know, a, a response rather than immediately think rats have to be removed. Great, thank you, David. We've got a question. I think it's actually from Alan. Um, uh, Alan will be speaking um, next. Um, so Alan's asked. I suppose bearing in mind that we're speaking to a lot of hedgehog friendly campus teams today and, and those teams are doing a lot to um, enhance the site for hedgehogs and often that can mean um, you know, sl slightly wilder spaces and spaces that are um, uh, of benefit to multiple species. And Alan's actually asked, could a, could a rat, we said rat infested, but could could a, um, a campus with rats on be a hedgehog friendly campus? And uh, Alan's actually mentioned above, um, it's possible that rats can predate young hedgehogs, although I think we have a comment later on, later on in the chat box from Faye from the British Hedgehog Preservation Society to, to suggest that might not entirely be the case. But do you think, can a, can a, a campus with rats on be a hedgehog friendly one? Can the two get say, on? I would say yes, um, but, again, but it's about managing the levels of rats, yeah. I mean, rats at, at, at a, a fairly common uh, sort of abundance level. Um, I think would be okay. Um, I, I don't know whether, I mean, whether, whether, it, it, it's not unimaginable they would predate um, hoglets, um, but I think, but I mean, lots of other things might as well. Um, and I, I think that that, I, I don't think it's, I think uh, trying to make something sort of one species friendly by excluding the other species, which might interact with it and might sort of have a, a negative effect. Isn't the way forward because then you're just ex you're endlessly battling and trying to exclude other things and, and having a very just having reducing your biodiversity um, <clears throat> and really what you want are, are habitats that support um, a lot I think you know that support biodiversity and, and multiple species yeah they are going to eat each other that's that's just nature and um, and yes if you had no rats at all then you might have uh, uh, a slightly Larger proportion of hoglet surviving, and or, or not. I mean, I don't know the instance of, of, of rats eating. I, I'd imagine it's fairly small, but they, they might do. Um, but that's my point. I think I think you just have to have to it, it, look at the whole overall balance. And I think a, a campus which does have rats will, it will probably have foxes as well. And foxes will certainly pre um, predate young hedgehogs, probably, and also put, uh, uh, injure adult ones. But you know, I wouldn't advocate removing foxes from green spaces or anything else. It's interesting you say that we've had a message on the chat box from Alex over at Lincoln University. Uh, they've deployed a lot of cameras, and wildlife um, footprint tunnels on their campus. They've actually seen a, a, a fox hunting a rat on their campus. So they've right. got some biological content on there. How interesting. You should submit that to the yeah. Living with Mammals survey, perhaps. We had some interest in the Living with Mammals survey on the chat box there. And um, thank you to Faye, who's put the link in there um, for people to find out a little bit more oh, yeah. about that. 
Um, and is is that the best yeah. uh, the best place to look to get involved? Then, David, the website PTS. Yeah, if you have to, we'll tell you more about it. I mean, it's fairly as I say, straightforward. Um, it's online survey. You can register to take part. Um, uh, and really, it's 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 uh, yeah, you know, it's a little time as much as you can you can contribute each week. Um, it doesn't have to be every week. Uh, through a year, just telling us what you see. Um, and it's everything too. Rats, hedgehogs, are very important. I mean, it's it's it provided perhaps the best evidence to date about. Um, changes in he hedgehog populations, uh, certainly in urban areas. Um, so it's very valuable information. Um, and yeah, and, it, and, it, and it just and it's broad as well. So so yeah, lots of things like rats and foxes very useful as well. And will we find on that website more information about? You, know, you said you can report sightings and signs data. Can you find more information about signs data there for rats? So I think a lot of people know what droppings look like but perhaps there are other signs people can be on the lookout for uh yeah so with the survey we do we do try and provide as much information as we can about um identification of signs um it's being added to all the time yes but yes so a little bit on on um what to look out for really for everything and, and rats included um i mean with, with rats you yeah it's pretty, i would say primarily the droppings and, and runs which are sometimes i mean uh, they're quite habitual sort of in, in their in the roots so they they take through things where so they're very wary of unfamiliar objects um, and tend to stick to uh, uh, sort of familiar paths and routes. And so you get these runs developing, um, which can be spotted, a little bit tricky to spot, but you, you, know, you can identify them. Uh, and it's the droppings as well, probably a primary sign with rats. Absolutely wonderful. That's great. Um, I'm hoping that we've got some perhaps student um, students or student teams that might be interested in perhaps checking that out, seeing if there's anything you can contribute there, um, either through the Hedgehog Friendly Campus team or, or other societies or, or similar. We do have a number of other questions. Um, uh, a couple from Jessica. Um, that I think, Jessica, there might be talks that may cover your question. So I don't think I'll direct these to David just now. Um, but we do just have one from Anne-Marie um, Hewitt that I just want to, to quickly run by you, David. Do rats actually chew K electric cables? That's one we've mm. all heard, I think. They do, yeah. Well, rats, I mean, rodents, one of the characteristics of rodents, I mean, they gnaw, they gnaw. Um, and they have very distinctive, uh, the incisors, very large incisors, uh, a characteristic of rodents. And, and that's what we do, we gnaw things. And whether it's um, yeah, electrical cables, um, other bits of buildings, um, you know, uh, packaging and food, and, and food um, materials, yes, they do gnaw and they, they will do, yes. And your books. <laughs> so, and my books, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so that's fantastic. Thanks so much, David. And the questions we had um, from Jessica, they relate a little bit more to um, uh, kind of the le legal requirements and um, uh, for, for, for uh, taking action, which um, we will have the answers to these in uh, upcoming presentations. But if you don't have your question answered throughout the um, presentations today, Jessica, please do pop the, your question back into the chat box. I mean, hopefully we'll get to somebody who can answer it. So fantastic. We are running very well to time. Um, so uh, we will take a short break now, short comfort break. Thanks so much, David. That was fantastic. Sure. I hope you will stay um, if you can to listen to the rest of the talks today. Um, sure. And so we will be back um, at quarter two. So if we can take a, a 15 minute uh, comfort break and we, we'll be back um, with uh, the next upcoming talk from uh, Dr. Alan Buckle um, at quarter two. Great, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope that was enough time for you to go up and get a drink and have, have a snack and be ready for our next talk. Our next talk's from Dr. Alan Buckle at the University of Reading. In this talk, um, Rodenticides, the uses, if efficacy and impact. Alan is currently a, a visiting research fellow at the University of Reading. And Alan is also the chairman um, of the Campaign for Responsible Rodenticide Use or uh, CREW that some of you may have heard of. Alan has a long career in pest control for public health, um, primarily in tropical disease um, within uh, industry and government. And Alan also has a PhD in hedgehog hibernation from Royal Holloway, uh, where he studied with Dr. Pat Morris. Um, so uh, we'll be listening to um, Alan's talk with interest, I'm sure. So um, Alan, are you there? <laughs> Yes, let me unmute Fantastic. and um, I'll switch on some video. Thanks very much. And then do you want me to share screen? 
Yes, please, if you can. Okay, let's we'll see how we go. <laughs> I'll let you know how it looks from this end. And while Alan is setting up, just a reminder, we do have a hashtag for the conference on the chat box at the moment, uh, hashtag coexisting with rats. Alan, fantastic. I can see those slides okay, but it's um, started some way in. It has. <laughs> um, so just let me see if I can do something about that. Hmm. It's not letting me do anything at all. Um, um, are you um, able to click through the uh, slides or use the um, arrow buttons to, to transition through the slides? No. Um, well, I, I was. It's not moving at all. Um, do, you, do you want to try um, um, stop share and perhaps try sharing again to see if that if that helps from the um, from the top of your presentation? Yeah. really not sure what's what's going on at all it's um i'm seeing my presentation but i've got i'm on that single slide i can't press this oh hold on yes i can <laughs> it, it's just rather slow i think oh not to worry we've um we've got a little time if if you can't get it to work this try around alan i'll um i'll show you a slide from my side okay um so i can now see it um let me go back to, oh my word. Um, so now I can see your face and my um, PowerPoint slide, uh, but I'm not seeing my Zoom buttons. Um, how interesting. I'm not really sure what's happened there, Alan. Um, I'll tell you what we'll do instead. If you're happy with this, I can share, I uh, have your updated version, so I can share your slides from my side. You'll just have to let me know when you're ready to move slides along. Okay. Um, does that sound all right? Well, um, it's not perfect, but better than. Uh, hold on. Uh, wait a minute. X. <laughs> yep. I've just found. Let me let me try sharing screen one more time. Sure. Let me. That's done it. Has it? That's good. Thanks, very, very good. So I'm I'm sorry for that. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll get on with this. Um, so Joe asked me to talk to you about rodenticides and uses and efficacy and impacts. Um, what I'm not going to do is I'm not obviously going to try to persuade you about the 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 um, uses of rodenticides, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, what I'm gonna try and do is provide you with information about this, um, and particularly information about how people go about doing rodent control and how they use rodenticides, and what are the rules and regulations ar around them, and then go on and talk about uh, what are the risks of, of, um, of using the rodenticides that are commonly used in, the, in this country. I'll start off by saying a little bit about why we control rodents, um, and it's certainly going to um, touch on some of the things that, that David spoke about. Um, but so that will explain why when people do control rodents or feel that they need to, why, why, why they do. So David mentioned um, why control rodents, and um, this is a study that was done at the University of Oxford of, well, quite some time ago now, as you can see, it's published in 1995. Um, and they caught um, rats on farms and they um, carried out a number of investigations about what the various diseases and um, parasites those rats were, were carrying. And you can see this list, I'm not gonna go through the list, um, but there are a number of, uh, here, a number of ectoparasites, helminths and, and rickettsial um, organisms. Um, and it went on um, and they found some bacteria, protozoa and viruses. And you can see um, the frequency of um, the percentage of the animals that they captured that carried these diseases. Um, David mentioned viral disease led to spirosis. Um, and he mentioned how few um, cases there are. Um, certainly in my view, um, that's a disease that's dramatically 
um, underdiagnosed in the UK. And um, just a few years ago, I was one of the very few who did get diagnosed. And the, the problem is that um, only Port and Down can do the tests to find um, Leptospira in, in blood samples. And so it's not very often done. Um, but so those are, are the diseases from a sample of rats in the UK. Um, these rats um, are from a, a park, um, a suburban park in, um, in France, in fact. Um, and you can see there the list of Helminth's bacteria, protozoa and other things that they, they found. They did look for coronavirus. This was before uh, the coronavirus, um, but they didn't find any coronaviruses in their um, rats in that French study. But basically um, lots and lots of, of, of organisms that are carried by rats. And I absolutely take David's point that um, most wildlife carries this sort of suite of, of, of diseases. But generally most wildlife don't try to live quite so close to us as um, normal rats do. And it, it's that interaction and that proximity that gives people um, the concern about, about these things. Um, so just to summarize, rats carry diseases. Anyone who shares spaces with rats indoors or outdoors is, is at risk. Um, that may be a low risk um, in some circumstances. It may be a very low risk or it may be a high risk. Um, those that I, I think would be in decision making positions on campuses and in universities would consider that they, they do have a duty of care to those who work and live on, on campus. Um, to protect them from the risk of um, acquiring rodent-borne diseases. And um, just thinking, as I was thinking about the title of this, this whole um, symposium, um, what I would say, if you don't have a comprehensive pest management strategy on the campus, um, and certainly if you're going to decide to coexist with rats on campuses, I would certainly um, go through the process of doing a risk assessment of that decision. And you can see um, health and safety executive explain to you how you can do these risk assessments. And I would certainly, if you're going to decide that you're gonna live with rats on campuses, I, I would suggest a risk assessment and keeping it um, on record so that it can show that you have considered all the positives and the um, pluses of, of, of living with, with rats. Um, most campuses, I'd be pretty sure, do have um, comprehensive pest management strategies. And I, I'm pretty sure also that most um, would have contracts with competent professional pest control companies to carry out um, rodent pest management, as well as all the other um, pests that, that um, pest professionals um, control. Um, what will be certain is that the strategies that any professional pest controller would um, use on a university campus will differ dramatically in different parts of the campus. I, one of the earlier questions about food and food preparation, food storage areas um, was about there are certain strict um, rules about what um, pest control needs to be done um, in, in, in those areas. And certainly that there are much more sensitive areas than others. And so there will be different strategies. So I was going to start to it's about rodenticides and I'm going to give you this list of, of, of the rodenticides that are, are authorised for use in the UK. Don't worry about the, the, the whitened out side on the right. I'm going to come back to this slide later on. Um, but these are the substances that are authorised by the Health and Safety, safety Executive for, for use to control um, rodents in the UK. So these are our rodenticides. You can see there are four groups that the main group, the most widely used group, are these anticoagulants and they fall into three groups. There are the first generation anticoagulants, the um, warfarin and cumitetrolyl. Then the second generation that were invented many years ago now, probably 50 years ago, um, to combat resistance to the first generation, we have five of those. Um, bromodialone, diphenacum, brodiaficum, diphethylone, flucumafen. Um, I will touch on some of these um, chemical names again, but essentially the, the, the eschars fall into these two groups, um, bromodal and diphenacum, and then the three most potent ones, um, and the best resistance breaking substances are, are, the, are those three. Um, this, the, uh, the, the group two, calciferol, um, 
or cholecalciferol. This is a, a relatively new introduction. Um, we had it up to 2006. It left the market in 2006. It's just come back this last year and it has some interesting characteristics and opportunities. Um, then there's a, a narcotic alpha chlorolose that's used just indoors for the control of mice. And then we have a number of, of gases that are used in very specialist ways and are usually administered only by very specialist teams um, with uh, strong tra training and other um, um, careful management of their use. And I, I would imagine that these things are very re rarely used on, on university campuses, but that's an inventory of the, of the rodenticides that, that can be used in the UK. Um, I wanted to explain these four rodenticide use scenarios. Um, they're, they're, they're very carefully described. Um, and these use scenarios allow the regulatory assessment of both the efficacy and the risks of the application of rodenticides. So essentially when people want to sell a rodenticide for use in the UK, they have to declare um, what uses they wish to use and what are the use scenarios they wish these products to be used in. And there are four of them. So the first one is, is indoors. And so that would be um, a product that's only used indoors. And there are not many of those, but there are some, and they're just used for house mice, really, because house mice tend to live indoors and are not found outdoors very much. Um, so they're used in food and storage and preparation areas. Um, you can't use them for controlling rats because rats live outside most of the time. Um, but that use has the least risk to non-target wildlife. Um, and there are just a few rodenticides, in fact, just this one, alpha chloros, which is restricted to that use alone. Now, the next one is, in fact, the, 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 the biggest pattern of use, and it's almost certainly the one that's most widely adopted on university campuses um, when rat control is used. It, it's called in and around buildings, and it's essentially, this is when rodent, um, rodenticides are used outdoors and indoors to control um, an infestation of a building. And nearly all the rodenticides that I listed just before are permitted for that use scenario. Now this brings a moderate risk to wildlife because they are applied outdoors. Um, the degree of the risk depends of course on where the building is that is being protected by this in and around application and what intersection those baits have with wildlife territories. And in some places they have very great inter intersection with wildlife territories, for example, um, on farms and around farm, farm buildings, in, in other places much, much less. So there are two more scenarios. Um, one is, is called open areas. And this is when a rodenticide is not used, is, is, is used um, not in association with any building and the target rodents are not infesting a building. Um, and this obviously has the greatest risk to wildlife, especially on, on farmland because there's this great, um, greatest interaction between the bait application and, and, and wildlife in those circumstances. On university campuses, it's likely to be a scenario that involves gardens, parkland, um, playing fields, experimental growing plots, and, and so on. Um, manufacturers of these rodenticides have voluntarily withdrawn the most potent second generation anticoagulants, that, that's those three I mentioned, from this scenario. So no open area use of rodenticide should employ one of those three most potent um, and persistent second generation anticoagulants. There's a fourth one, which I won't go into. It really doesn't in involve you on, on campuses. It, it's waste dumps. This is these great big um, open you know, tips that you see sometimes as you're driving around and they have the highest risk to wildlife because as I'm sure you've noticed, um, they really have abundant scavenging wildlife um, and so it's very important to be very careful when you deploy it road inside in those places and special rules apply to those. So those are the four use scenarios and I'm now going to talk about actually how the road denticides are set out in those um, scenarios. Um, this uh, and many of you may see these um, tamper resistant bait stations um, I see them very often when I go onto um, sites and including university campuses. And so you may see them as you go around the campus. Um, so this application is the absolute default application method on all rodenticide labels. 
you're virtually not allowed to apply a rodenticide in any other way than in a tamper resistant bait box. And you can see one there, they come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, colors, metals, plastics, and so on. Um, they do protect bait against larger animals than the targets. Um, and so I would imagine you'll tell me much better than I can guess, but small hedge hedgehogs will almost certainly get in there. Um, full grown ad adults, one, ad ad adults are unlikely to. Um, usually the baits are locked inside or held inside um, but sometimes they spill and so sometimes they come out. Um, there are some new label phrases um, about the robustness of these bait stations. Should have said the key thing with these is that of course um, animals the same size as the targets or smaller can get into them and can feed. Um, and what we found and what we suspect is that a very great deal of the wildlife contamination that we see across the UK, and I'm going to come back to that, is because um, when these base stations are put out and left with poison in them, um, wild small mammals, um, rats, um, mice and voles, go in and feed on the bait. And, uh, and those animals are the prey base of a very, very large number of our um, larger mammal and bird species. And we think that's it's these things that are um, helping to get an, um, anticoagulant rodenticides particularly out, out into the wider environment. Um, so they all sh always should be ground anchored so nobody can pick them up and walk away with them or, or shake the, 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 the bait out. I suspect, as I said, they're used quite widely on campuses. They may contain plain placebo baits um, as, a, as a, a monitoring method. And a key point is that some technicians um, keep baiting them all the time. And this is called permanent baiting. And it used to be the the standard way of doing rodent control to protect buildings and, and people. And that was to put these bait boxes out, can continually to keep them full of rodenticide, to check them once every four weeks or so and top them up again. Um, and, and that's a, a, a problematic method of, of using them. So this is permanent baiting. Um, it's, it, it's now um, very much um, objected to and um, it's now a non-standard method of using baits. And um, many, uh, many of the products that can be purchased um, are not um, allowed to be used in permanent baiting. Um, the plus for permanent baiting is that it protects sites from rodent immigration um, it, and it acts as an early warning system. So um, say rats coming onto a site um, and reinvading a site, um, they go into these bait stations, take the food, um, the technician checks it and, and sees that he's got a, a problem, he or she has got a problem. Um, now, a key thing is that nowadays, only some products containing just these two active substances can be used in permanent baiting at all. So that virtually precludes permanent baiting um, for many of these um, active substances. Um, Calciferol has just been added to the list of substances that can be used in permanent bait points. But there are new label requirements and these are very strict. Um, and you can only use permanent baiting, it, it, it's, it's strictly limited to sites with potential, a high potential for reinvasion, and that has to be proven and documented. And, and also when other methods of control have proven insufficient. Now the word proven is put on the labels specifically to say that you can't just adopt this as the first use. Um, you've got to have tried other things and proven that they are not working before you can adopt this rather more extreme um, method of, of bait application. Um, you have to do periodic reviews. You have to um, inspect regularly every four weeks when they're used out outdoors. And there are many other um, risk mitigation measures that are, are employed um, put by, by crew. Um, now, this other method of, of applying baits is, is, is often adopted, um, not usually around buildings, but quite often in open areas, it's called burrow baiting. Um, many rodents are reluctant to enter those plastic bait stations that I've just shown you. Um, and then what happens is um, people leave baits in the bait stations. Um, rats are not going into them because they are suspicious of them, but this really prolongs 
the, 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 the duration of a bait application and therefore really increases the risk to non-target animals which get into the baits much before rats do. Um, so some people use this method, which is burrow baiting. It may improve and speed up bait up, uptake. So you get rid of the, the rodent infestation much more quickly. Um, it reduces the period of, of risk, but there's a significant risk of the bait being kicked out of these burrows and, and other animals finding it. Um, there, again, there's crew guidance on risk mitigation measures for this, all sorts of risk, risk mitigation. And again, this is a non-standard method and only products that actually say you can use them for burrow baiting can be used in this way. Now, uh, fi finally, another way to use um, baits it is in this um, covered and protected bait points. Um, again, uh, to avoid the use of those tamper resistant bait boxes, um, which have sometimes very slow uptake or may not even have any uptake at all, um, you can construct bait boxes or bait stations using materials on the site. And here you can see one that's um, down in a sewer on the benching in a sewer. There's going to be a great big um, cast iron lid put on that, um, which is every bit as secure as um, one of those temporal resistant bait stations. Many would say it's, it's more. Um, if, if people use baits in this way in covered and protected bait points, um, they have to show that those bait points are as robust as a temporal resistant bait box would, would be. So those are the different, different uh, use scenarios and those are the different ways of applying the baits. Um, crew that you've heard I'm, I'm um, the chair, chair of um, has a code of best practice um, and we've just revised it, um, taking the, in, into consideration lots of new things that have happened in the last few years. Um, it's the foundation of, of all of the training schemes for professional pest control, for farming and agriculture and, and gamekeeping. And, and now, um, because of a stewardship regime that um, Crew has applied, um, people, before they can buy a professional rodenticide, have to prove that they're competent to use it, which means they have to have taken a course, passed an exam, got a certificate, and they have to show up at the shop with that certificate in order to be allowed to buy these products, which is quite different to how it had been. Um, if you're interested in the Crew Code of Best Practice, um, you can get it online or I'm sure crew would be very happy to send you some, some copies of it. Now, I wanted to now introduce to you this concept of, of risk hierarchy. Um, it's an absolute requirement in the application of rodenticides um, to adopt this risk hierarchy concept, and it's fundamental to the crew code of best practice. And what it means is that um, when you conduct um, rodent pest management, um, you should always use the least severe method or methods. Now, by severe, we mean those having the less, less risk or the least risk should be used. Um, you don't have to try, start at the, at the least risk end, try it, find it doesn't work, then move up the risk hierarchy until you finally find one that works. You, you have to have a reasonable expectation that what you're doing is going to achieve the required results, but it's incumbent on all those who use these rodenticides to adopt this risk hi hierarchy approach. Um, it's obvious that methods that do not imply rodenticides such as improved site hygiene and proofing of buildings present less risk to those that, that require a rodenticide. And everyone who's involved with rodent pest management, um, first and foremost, will attempt to um, avoid the infestation entirely. This, this um, save you from the, the job of killing animals, which everyone wants to avoid. Um, and uh, obviously there are less risks. Um, this, the next step um, is an environmental risk, risk assessment. Um, and th these are again, relatively new introduction as a routine in the use of red insides. It's usually conducted before the application of any rodent control measures that consist of a lethal approach, and that includes traps, um, to insist uh, it assists the, consider, um, the consideration of the risk, the risk hierarchy. So when we think about rodent side risks, um, we look at risk in these compartments, um, and there are risks to the environment, um, water, soil, and air. There are obvious risks to non-target animals, wildlife companion animals, farm animals. There are risks to human health, operator exposures, and bystanders. And there's also risks to deal with the disposal of dead rodents that carry rodenticide residues. 
um, spent bait that's, that's wasted that may go bad in bait boxes, best has to be disposed of and contaminated equipment. So all of those things have, have, have risks and they all need to, need to be considered. Rodenticides differ in the risk they present in these different compartments and sites differ in the risk they present. So it's impossible to present a consolidated picture of the relative risk across that range of rodenticides that I, I showed you there. Um, some have higher risks than others in different situations. But um, there are some general comments that I, I, I can make. Um, and these are that the first generation anticoagulants, the FGARs, um, pre present less risk than the second generations because they are less persistent in the environment. The SGARs, second generation, present the greatest risk of both primary and secondary poison of wildlife. Burrow fruit fumigants present the less risk to wildlife, as long as you're very sure who's living in the burrow that you are fumigating. Um, the fumigants dissipate very quickly, so there's almost no secondary risk, but they, they do have the greater risk to operators and bystanders. Only very skilled people can do that. Um, the European Commission has just reviewed this, this, um, it's, this new um, cocacifor. In fact, it's coming back to the market after 15 or 17 years, but when they did that, the European Commission said that this cocacifor, which is vitamin D3, may be considered to have overall a better toxicological and ecotoxicological profile compared to the anticoagulant active substances. So this is something that people are keeping in mind. And certainly the manufacturers that sell, and there are two of them that sell cocacifor products, are, are, are making um, quite a lot of um, statements about their uh, tox and ecotox profiles. Um, finally, there's um, alpha chlorolose, that one that I mentioned. It, it, it's, um, there's a very limited risk, risk of secondary poisoning with, with that one, but it can only be used against mice in, indoors. But those are just general comments about rodenticides and risks. Um, risk mitigation is incredibly important. Um, all of the rodenticides are potent vertebrate toxicants and just cannot be used without the adoption of stringent risk mitigation. There's a wide range of risk mitigation measures available. Um, my colleague from Reading, Colin Prescott, and I wrote a chapter in this book, Anticoagulants and Wildlife, called Anticoagulants and Risk Mitigation. And just about everything I know about risk mitigation is written in that chapter, if you want to find out more about that. Um, the active su substance um, EU implementing directive. So these are the EU directives that permit products to go onto the market say that they can only be used if risks are, minima um, are minimized by considering and applying all appropriate available risk mitigation measures. So it, it's a non-negotiable thing. Um, th these, these products can only be used if you apply all appropriate and available risk mitigation. Now, risk mitigation um, works reasonably well to reduce the risk and accidental exposures that result in acute harm. In other words, although they do kill accidentally some animals, um, it's relatively rare for that to happen. What is not rare is that current risk mitigation is simply not preventing widespread wildlife exposure. And it's that that um, the that, that crew and the regime that we're running is trying to avoid and to reduce. If you want to, I'm not going to say much more about risk management, but there, there, there is a very good framework for risk ma management in um, the use of, of, of chemicals. There's another excellent book. It's my, my sort of Bible on risk assessment of chemicals. Um, you go through these eight stages and at the end you get a risk assessment um, for a particular purpose against a, a particular chemical, you may or may not wish to think about, about that. So um, I'm trying to watch the, watch the time. I, um, I don't think any of this is going to be um, a surprise to, to any of you, but I, I put this up just to show the roots of, of wildlife exposure. Um, and there you have a bait, um, they're in bait boxes. And, and so although this was written by American authors and they said that, um, the bait boxes are not mandatory in the EU. In fact, that was wrong when they printed it, but it's certainly wrong now. They are mandatory in the EU. Notwithstanding the use of these bait boxes, there's spillage outside and things like pigeons and other primary feeders um, can take spilled bait. Um, insects and mollusks go inside and feed on bait and then come out and they themselves are 
consumed um, and um, therefore pass through it insights up the food chain and you can see um, there are primary and secondary consumption of, of baits and this is how these things are getting into our, our wildlife. Now I'm just going to give a couple of um, bits of information about, um, about wildlife and anticoagulants. Um, I could have done this for probably 10 different species, but I, I chose to do it for hedgehogs, obviously, because of the audience. Now, this stu study, some of you may be aware of it, um, and I know that Emily is going to say something more, um, almost certainly um, more recent than this 2013 study. But it was it was published in 2017, no, 2013. Um, they found um, 150 dead hedgehogs. Um, of those, 55 had died of injury, and they couldn't work out what had killed 46 of them. They, they decided the natural causes um, were 18, and, and there was one suspected chemical poisoning um, that, that was not a rodenticide. Um, they post-mortemed 120, um, and none of them had any signs of hemorrhage that, that were not caused by injury. Uh, and it's those signs of hemorrhage which are typical symptoms of anticoagulant poisoning. And so their conclusion, and I'll be very interested to hear, and, um, and I'm sure Emily will update us on this, but their conclusion was, well, that exposure of hedgehogs to anticoagulants may be widespread. There's no evidence from our study that this commonly causes lethal, lethal poisoning. Now, as a similar study, uh, or there's a series of studies going on, um, crew with um, Center for Ecology and Hy Hydrology is required by government every year to look at the bodies of 100 barn owls and look at the residues of the five second generation anticoagulants in them. And we've been doing that now for five years and you can see the data there. Because every year we do 100, um, these are all percentages and they, they obviously are precisely the same. Um, it, it, it's a requirement on the UK rodenticide stewardship re regime. The barn owl is a, is, a, is a selected sentinel species, um, typical of one particular pathway of wildlife contamination. Now the desk, uh, of these birds um, are mainly starvation injury, injury, disease, and suspected poisoning. And in those five years of those 500 birds, just one um, was post-mortem and found most likely to have been killed by a second generation anticoagulant. So, the, um, but you can see along the bottom there, um, somewhere between, 80 and 95% of barn owls carry residues. In other words, at some point in their lives, they have consumed a rodent that has consumed bait. And because these things are all very persistent in the environment, um, the barn owls become, if you like, tagged with those rodenticides. So um, there's wildlife, wide, widespread um, low level exposure. Um, we should have been bringing that down, um, but um, over the five years of the stewardship, um, regime, although a lot has been achieved, what we haven't achieved is significantly to reduce um, the exposure of barn owls, the sentinel species. But there have been no increases either over the five years. So I'm going to say something very briefly about efficacy. Um, Joe asked me to say something. Um, all authorities of rodenticides are evaluated for efficacy and meet uh, regulatory efficacy requirements. In other words, they all should work um, because they've been tested. Um, but they must all only be used against label target species and advice on the label. When that happens, they should work. Um, the major um, efficacy variable that we have in the UK at the moment is anticoagulant resistance. This has been around for more than 50 years. Um, unfortunately, the most effective resistance busting um, second generation anticoagulants are those three most risky ones. So we're in a rather catch um, 22 situation where we, we're faced with increasing resistance. We don't want to use the potent resistance busting ones, but we're having to because of resistance. Um, so on the other hand, the use of resisted, the continued use of resistance substance in resistance areas, um, it spreads resistance, it increases the severity of resistance, and it creates environmental risk with little or no benefit to public or animal health. Um, and so it's very important to understand um, resistance in areas where anticoagulants are being used. Um, problem is resistance is not that simple. Um, here we have um, Norway rat resistance. And unfortunately we have 
and no one else has five um, effective resistance mutations. These are, there are many other um, resistance mutations, but these are the ones that actually affect the efficacy of rodenticides. We've got these five um, and they differ in their severity. So for example, um, the one that we have around the University of Reading, and I'm sure is causing um, that um, cat to come in quite so frequently with, um, with, with rats, um, they, will have all, they will all have the L120Q um, resistance mutation. There are other specific, specific mutations in, in Kent um, that started in Kent. Um, these have all spread very, very widely. Um, there's now um, a crew funded project with the um, animal um, plant and, um, sorry, I can't quite remember what APH stands for these days, Animal and Plant Health um, Agency, sorry. Um, so this shows the distribution of resistant rodents. Um, the, 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 the red boxes to, uh, are that potent L120Q. You can see it's spreading. It started in, in Hampshire and Berkshire. It, it, it's spreading quite wide, widely. There are a number of other resistance mutations. You can see rather interestingly, right in the middle of the country, there's a whole area there in the Midlands um, where we have very, very few samples, but those samples we do have are actually susceptible. Um, UK has more mutations than any other country in the world. We've done more resistant testing. Southern England, uh, where uh, University of Reading is, is highly resistant and much sampled. It's sampled because we've been doing this study at the University of Reading for, for a long time, uh, and it, it's where we can get to most readily. Uh, resistance is, is patchy elsewhere. Um, we know much less about house mice, and I know that's perhaps not so important to this audience, but um, there are two house mice um, mutations. Um, we've got 93 samples and 93.5% and of those um, are, are resistant, so a very, very high level of resistance in, in, in house mice infestations. Um, and the assumption is that almost all house mice infestations are, are resistant to the first generation anticoagulants and those two lesser potent second generation anticoagulants. So um, I'm going to come back to this, um, this categorization now. Um, and you can see the categories of rodenticides that I showed you before. Um, and there are now recommendations from the, the RRAG, the, the Rodenticide Resistance Action Group, as to what active substances can be used against which mutations. And what we're going to, what, what I would like to see, it, it's not happening yet, but what we'd like to see is these um, resistance sorry, the, these compound groupings like 1A, 1B, 1C, 2, 3, 4, shown on the labels of, of rodenticides um, and more training of those who use them so that they know which substances to use where. And, but they know where they can use them because all of that University of Reading data has now been fed into um, these interactive maps that are shown on the Rodenticide Resistance Action Committee, that's an international committee, um, and you can dial in to um, this website and you can put in your map coordinates and um, some other variables you can see there in the drop down box, and you can find out how far you are from a resistant rat, um, and in some places you'll be a bit closer than 60 meters or 100 meters, in some places you'll be, looks like 100 miles from a, from a a resistant rat. But this is a new um, interactive pro process. Um, you can see quite a lot of the country has got no information. And um, we're very, very keen if any of you on campuses, if anyone um, knows of people that are trapping rats for whatever reason, I'll show you here, um, you can write off to um, the crew. Um, you can go on online, um, the crew website, you can ask for these testing kits and um, you can send a, a tissue sample, it's just the tip of the tail. This will go to the Animal and Plant Health Agency, they'll do the DNA screening and you'll get to know whether the rats are resistant or not on your campuses and whether or not you can get away with using the least um, extreme in that risk hierarchy of active substances. I think that's it. Um, I'm very sorry if I missed something you wanted to hear me cover. Um, I'd be very happy to um, um, be involved in phone calls or email discussions with any of you if you want to ask me questions afterwards. Um, but anyway, I, I think we've left a little bit of time for questions in Joe's um, schedule.
Fantastic. Thank you, Alan. Yes, plenty of time for questions there, which is good because we've got quite a few <laughs> questions and, and just general discussion going on in the in the chat box, which is always nice to see. Um, so we've got actually a question from Richie. Hi, Richie over at um, U, UE. Um, Richie, and then this was a question from earlier on in your presentation, has asked, how close to a building is considered in and around a building? Um, that, that's something that the European Commission discussed for months on end. Um, they came to no absolute decision. Um, when people use these in and around buildings products, they have to, um, and it's left up to them, put, the, put their hands on their hearts and say, these rodents that I am addressing with these substances are infesting that building. And so it, it's as far away from the building as you need to go to address the infestation that is getting into the building or around the building. So there's no meters involved. They, they, they thought for a long time about 20 meters, 50 meters, 100 meters. They realized that rats don't have tape measures and they, they, they travel sometimes quite long distances. So there's no absolute distance. Great, thank you. Um, and we have um, some discussion really going into the chat box regarding rodenticides in general. Um, so uh, some chat here from Kevin. Kevin, it's it's Kevin's view that uh, we shouldn't be using any rodenticides in any open areas because this is the greatest risk to wildlife. Um, we are in a in a climate crisis and wildlife crisis. It's not. It's the, probably the time for a new approach. Is Kevin's view there? Any comments on that, Alan? Um, well, um, it, it's not really for me to decide these things. Um, we have a regulatory authority. It's called the Competent Authority for Biocides. It's the Health and Safety Executive. Um, they hear from all sides, and if Kevin wants to make that point, um, I, I'm sure he'll make a very strong point to the Health and Safety Executive. At the moment. Um, a few active substances can be used um, away from buildings. And um, with my um, University of Reading hat firmly on and my crew hat firmly off, um, I would certainly say that we all understand that um, those open area uh, applications carry the greatest risk to wildlife. Thanks, Alan, for your comments on that, on that question, on, on that general um comment there. A comment on there from Faye, we've, we've been talking a little earlier on um, about the size of the um, of the entrance uh, holes for rat bait stations um, and Faye um, from the Hedgehog Society concerned about these that those gaps are usually large enough for um, many hedgehogs to access not necessarily the larger hedgehogs. Um, not sure what research has been done into that and I hope Emily might be able to give us a little bit more light on that but that, thanks for that comment there Faye. Can I just say that there, there are a number, well, certainly um, that, that those boxes, the, the apertures do differ. Um, and inside them, there are often baffles and um, difficulties put in the way of animals to get further in to get to the bait. And so not just getting through the aperture doesn't necessarily get a, 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 a hedgehog to the bait. There's no doubt that small hedgehogs would get in. Um, and there's actually no doubt that some big rats um, can't get in. Um, I've bumped into rats of seven, eight hundred grams, and they certainly wouldn't get into some of these bait, bait boxes. But um, when, when they that they are designed, obviously um, there's some sort of happy medium. They want to make the holes as small as possible to keep everything out, but they've got to let the rat, the, um, the target uh, uh, rats in. There's been lots of research. There's a new bait um, box um, that. Uh, it is electronically opened and it has to have um, on a treadle um, an animal of the weight of a, of a rat. Now, again, an adult hedgehog is the weight of a rat, um, but it stops the smaller, small mammals like um, field mice and voles getting in. Um, and so it's not open the whole time. It, it's, it only opens when it detects um, a, a large mammal trying to get into it. So. There are developments and, and lots of people are still working on all of these things. That's really interesting to hear of that um, sort of new technology there. It's interesting to hear because of your comments earlier, Alan, that uh, a lot of rats won't um, behaviorally won't go anywhere near those. Um, they do, are, are they very successful? <laughs> so, well, the, we, um, we... the treadle version? Um, 
Well, I think that the, 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 the treadle version would be no better than any other. Um, we, we did a study uh, at Reading a few years ago. We, we looked at um, three different bait box designs and we looked at bait boxes like the ones I described, constructed um, to be as robust as bait boxes, but um, constructed with local materials that, that sort of smelled of the site, um, bits, of, bits of corrugated iron, bricks and things that we could find. And seven times more bait was consumed from those that we constructed using on-site materials than from any of the three different designs of bait boxes. So, and they were quite different designs of bait boxes, um, but they all had exactly the same detrimental effect on bait uptake. So um, yeah, that is a problem. And we have got a, a, a paper on that if anyone wants to read that. Fascinating. There's lot, lots of links and um, papers and uh, books, Alan, that you've mentioned today. I hope I might be able to get the links from you so I can share them with people after afterwards. We do have a, a few questions on there as well. One from Jessica, and I was interested in this as well, and um, apologies for butchering the pr uh, pronunciation here. Is it called calciferol? Um, yes. In the um, version of the, uh, of the of the bait. So what's, how, what's the kind of biological control there what, what what's the actual effect on the on the animal on the on the on the rat or the mouse how does it kill um, them? <laughs> how does it kill them um well it's vitamin d and just like many many vitamins um if you get a super dose of vitamins they can be very harmful and this one most certainly is so um i take a bit of extra vitamin d i don't get enough sunlight and most of us don't these days um but um what it does it um it upsets the calcium metabolism. A vitamin D is required for good calcium metabolism in, in um, mammals and birds. Um, it upsets the calcium metabolism and um, the blood becomes um, hypercalcemic. In other words, there's lots of, of mobile calcium. And then the calcium is deposited in various places, mainly um, the blood vessels of the, of the heart. And so you get hardly a blood um, and, and it kills them in, in, that, in that way. Um, I've just recently been involved in a publication that's gonna be coming out very soon about the humaneness of these various um, anticoagulants and cumicalciferol and alphachloros and other ones. So um, there are differences in the humaneness of these um, rodenticides, but I, I'm not giving anything away. I think when I, I did this work with Sandra Baker at the University of Oxford, um, Codicalciferol was considered as inhumane as the second generation anticoagulants are. So there's no humaneness benefit there, I'm afraid. Sure. And I think um, part of Jess, uh, Jessica's question or, or point is that if um, if uh, col col colicalciferol has that impact on rats and mice, um, surely they sh there wouldn't be anything preventing uh, other non-target animals from um, suffering the same fate. I'm sure that's, um, that's true. Uh, hedgehogs, for instance. Um, uh, so I think that was just a, a general comment there. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Um, all, all, I, all I would say is, um, is that that's absolutely true from the point of view of primary consumption. Um, on a weight for weight basis, I don't think anyone knows um, whether colicacetyl or how toxic it is to um, insectivores. Um, I would say that I've done some work on the um, susceptibility of one insectivore, that's um, moles to anticoagulants, and that one was incredibly unsusceptible to um to many of the most potent anticoagulants um but um codicalciferol is not passed up the food chain um it, it is not carried um over from a, 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 a rodent that's been killed by it um and so it has that in my uh, personal opinion a very great advantage and it, that advantage is being made clear by the manufacturers and those who sell codicacifor products these days in the UK. And you can go online and, and watch their presentations on that. Wow, okay, thank you. I think that's clarified um, part of Jessica's question. So that's that's fantastic, thank you. Just filtering through to find the questions. Um, we have a question here from, um, from Faye over at the Hedgehog Society. We know hedgehogs can sometimes use burrows for nesting in. I'm sure, Alan, you'll be familiar with this from your um, PhD days as well. Can we be confident that burrows um, with hedgehogs in uh, would never be would never be baited directly, or what's the, is there any process there to find out what's actually inside the, the burrow? Um, there's there is there is no absolute ability to to know um, what what's going on. Those gases are used um, more for rabbit control than they are for rat control, and obviously those burrows are much larger. Um, 
a rat burrow generally is much smaller than a burrow that any adult hedgehog would get into. Um, and, but certainly the people who do um, um, burrow fumigation using those substances, it's incumbent upon them um, to determine that the burrows that they are fumigating are um, inhabited by target species. And they would be looking for all sorts of things like tracks and signs. David was saying that as rodents move around the territories, they, they do leave um, tracks, that very well-worn tracks. And it's usually fairly easy to see that a burrow system is a rat burrow system. Um, and mostly hedgehogs, I think, would not go there, but it's, um, it's, it's impossible to exclude that as a possibility. Thank you, Alan. And um, I must just say, uh, just as a, a little bit of a disclaimer, that the talks today um, from all of our speakers and any comments um, or questions in the chat box aren't necessarily uh, the views or opinions of the British Hedgehog Preservation Society or of us at Hedgehog Friendly Campus. Um, so please do bear that in mind. And I think we've probably got time for one last question, Alan, if that's okay, before we take a short break. Um, and uh, and then we move on to our uh, on to our um, next talk. And I'm just going to pick. <laughs> I'm going to pick. Um, uh, I think I'll I'll pick Liz's question. Uh, Liz Harris from Solent University. Hi, Liz. Um, Liz is concerned about uh, their campus team using rat bait stations at a site in rural areas um, near a lake, uh, which includes water voles and otters um, and other biodiversity. Um, could Liz argue that this is unnecessary? The campus is quite remote, not open to the public, and only used by students on boat training courses. Um, so, uh, any opinions um, there, Alan, from yourself? Um, well, there's so much to say there, Joe, quite honestly. Um, if there's proof that there are water voles in that site, um, then um, I'm not sure if it's, I, I can't use the word illegal, but it's absolutely not advised to apply any rodenticide in any way in any habitat where it is known that water voles are present. I mean, they're, they're a highly protected species and, and um, rodenticide bait boxes in their territories um, would, would be, of, of course, put them at, at, at big risk. So that, that shouldn't be happening um, if it's known that there are water voles there. And the otters, um, obviously the water voles get in the bait, then the um, otters are gonna possibly eat the water voles or, or not so um, that, that, that's all bad things. Now, um, it should be that whoever's doing that um, pest control operation would carry out a, a risk assessment and an environmental risk assessment um, in that circumstance. And they would be expected to have a risk assessment that says we are doing this um, because um, these are the risks that we perceive and this is the reason that we're doing it. And obviously I'm not party to that. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't say 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 much more. I don't really know the uh, the circumstance. Of course, yes. Thank thank you for your opinion on that, though, Alan. And I, I would I would probably um, encourage you, Liz. I'm not sure what it is that you do at the university, but I'd probably encourage um, you to do a little bit of digging there. Maybe ask some questions um, and see if you can find um, anything online to support to support any of the claims that Alan's made, which certainly sound sound reasonable. So um, we do have a few more questions on the chat box. I realise that and apologies that we haven't had a chance to get through all of them. Alan, you, I hope you can stick around for the rest of the talk. So there may be some time for yeah. you to answer some um, questions towards the end of the, the session, if that's all right. Y yes, I, um, I, I certainly will. And can I just say, if that doesn't happen, if anyone uh, or if you want to pass the question on to me with an email address, I'd be very happy to do it that, that way. But I, I shall be around to the end. Lovely. Thank you, Alan. Great. So um, we will take a short break now. Um, so we have our next talk due uh, at quarter two. So we'll just take a, a quick five minute. Hopefully that's plenty of time for you to go and have a quick comfort break and grab a drink. So we'll see you back in five minutes for our next talk. Great. Welcome back, everyone. Um, from your, your short comfort break, we're going to move swiftly on. We have two more talks in the lineup for you today, and um, the first of which are relatively short talk from, um, from Emily, Emily Williams from the University of Lincoln, who will be talking to us about rodenticides and whether they pose a threat to European hedgehogs. Emily is a master's research student at the Uni of Lincoln, um, where Emily studies rodenticides and hedgehogs. Um, Emily is also a student hedgehog ambassador for Lincoln's Hedgehog Friendly Campus campaign. Um, so uh, we're we're really happy to have Emily come and speak today. Um, Emily, are you there? 
Yes, I am. Can you hear Hello. me? And you should Hi. be able to see me in a minute. Has that worked? Hello. <laughs> yes. Hi. You. Right. Do you want to give um, give it a go, sharing your slides? Yes, maybe? I will give it a go. Wow. Hopefully it works. Um, that done anything? Yes. Yes. Amazing. Uh, see, see the slides. Yeah. You just want to make them. Fab. I just, I do, but it won't let, ah, why won't it let me do that? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe if I do that. Bingo. There we go. That's all worked all right, hasn't it? Yeah. Looks great. Thanks, Emily. Brilliant. So like Joe said, um, I'm currently studying for my master's at the University of Lincoln, and I'm just coming to the end of it actually in January. And for my thesis, I've been looking at whether red endocytes commonly used in the UK pose a threat to European hedgehogs or not. Oh, my graph's gone. It's okay, I can describe it. So um, the European hedgehog is an insectivorous mammal found mainly across Britain and Western Europe, but it's also an introduced species over in New Zealand as well. Um, but across their kind of European geographic range, they've been experiencing quite severe declines over recent years. So in 2007, they were categorised as a priority conservation species in Britain. And then following this last year, they were classified as vulnerable by the Red List for Britain's mammals. However, despite these interventions, they're continuing to experience declines in the UK, and that's particularly prominent in rural areas. So what I did have that seems to have disappeared was a graph in the top right hand corner, which showed red hedgehog road casualties in the UK over the past couple of decades. And there's quite a sharp decline after about 2007, I think it was, um, which looks great on the surface because obviously there's less hedgehog road casualties. But the fact of the matter is, it's not very likely that hedgehogs are getting more road savvy. It's quite likely that the reason behind less hedgehogs being on the roads is that there's just less hedgehogs in general. Um, so because there's been such sharp declines, science has been looking at the threat um, to hedgehog populations in the UK in an attempt to try and aid conservation efforts. And it's a bit split between areas that have been really well identified in research and areas that haven't had so much research put into them yet. So areas that have been quite well researched are mainly surrounding habitats, so things like habitat loss, reduced habitat quality and habitat fragmentation. But areas that don't have so much research are things like climate change and disease. And disease is what I'm particularly interested in, and that itself can be divided into two subsections. So you've got infectious diseases, which are things like um, viruses, that sort of thing. And then you've got non-infectious diseases, which are things like pesticides. And within that, there's a particularly conspicuous gap in the literature available surrounding the threat of agricultural chemicals to populations. And one particular agricultural chemical that's been looked at in regards to hedgehog populations recently are rodenticides. So the most common rodenticides used in developed countries like the UK are vitamin K antagonists, as we've been talking about, um, which are also known as anticoagulants. And they work by interfering with the blood clotting mechanism of the vertebrates. However, hedgehogs are also invertebrates, not invertebrates, they're vertebrates. Um, and so they have similar blood crossing mechanisms to the target rodents. So any exposure to them could potentially be quite dangerous. And unfortunately, the exposure of European hedgehogs to rodenticides has been found to be quite common, despite the fact that this species has been rarely seen to consume rodents. So we're not entirely sure how it's getting into their systems because it's very unlikely that it's through um, eating contaminated rodents. So that's a bit of an issue because it's quite hard to intervene if we don't know how it's getting into their systems. Um, Sublethal exposure appears to be particularly common, which is concerning because it could be causing behavioural changes like disorientation, which then can then obviously lead to things like increased susceptibility to vehicular collision, that sort of thing. Um, lethal exposure doesn't appear to be quite as common, but it is thought that the numbers we've got for lethal exposure cases are an underestimate because when hedgehogs feel poorly, they tend to go to cryptic locations, so quite hidden locations, and they die in those cryptic locations if um, they've been exposed to anything lethally. So it's very likely that le any lethal exposure cases we're just not finding. So it's fairly likely that it is quite a severe underestimate of the lethal exposure cases. 
So, as I said, we're not entirely sure what the route of exposure is at the moment. However, two kind of main routes have been proposed. The first is direct consumption. So that would be where the hedgehogs are directly eating the contaminated bait. Um, but that's considered fairly unlikely in the grand scheme of things. And a more likely scenario that's been proposed is that it's happening through the consumption of contaminated prey. So, as I said, hedgehogs are insectivores. And it's been suggested that invertebrates might be exposing non-target insectable predators like European hedgehogs to identize through food chain transfer, um, also known as secondary poisoning. So there's a diagram on the right hand side, which I've taken from another paper because I just thought it yeah, illustrated it really well. And um, it's got three of the identities quite commonly used in the UK at the bottom. They're then taken up by invertebrates. So in this case, the example is a slug and the invertebrates are contaminated. And then in turn, those invertebrates are eaten by insectivores like shrews, starlings and hedgehogs who are in turn themselves poisoned. So research has supported this theory of secondary poisoning with rodenticide residues found in quite a lot of invertebrate species after they've been exposed under laboratory and field conditions. And that's included things like earthworms and slugs, which are known to be part of hedgehog diet. So that's quite concerning. However, research is limited and particularly research linking invertebrate exposure to hedgehog exposure, it's virtually non-existent. In fact, only one study's um, looked at it and that only looks at one specific species of slug. So we really don't know very much about it at all at the moment. So my thesis, I'm trying, well, I'm aiming to try and address this knowledge gap to see whether rodenticide contaminated invertebrates do pose an exposure risk to European hedgehogs or not. And I've divided it into two main chapters. The first is looking at invertebrates and their consumption of rodenticides. And the second is looking at hedgehogs and their exposure to rodenticides. So I have three main hypotheses. Um, the first is that invertebrates do consume rodenticides because obviously if they don't, it's a fairly unlikely mechanism of hedgehog exposure. Um, the second is that these rodenticide consuming invertebrates are common enough in the diet of European hedgehogs that their rodenticide consumption poses a risk of secondary poisoning. And the third is a bit um, off field, but I propose that environmental variables have an influence on hedgehog diet and so have an influence on their exposure to rodenticides. So chapter one, as I said, is looking at invertebrates and rodenticide, and that kicked off way back in February with a pilot study. And I decided to carry out a pilot study because I wanted to see if I could use a substitute to rodenticides in my study, um, because obviously rodenticides um, are a pesticide and I wanted to try and limit that if I could. Um, and so the thing that I decided to try and use as a substitute was the biomarker rhodamine B, which is used quite a lot in um, food chain research because it shows up quite well in tissues and blood and hemolymph, all that kind of thing. Um, and because it fluoresces under UV light. So it's used quite a lot in food chain research because it's just really good for it. So it took a few goes at it. Um, the first try I, Try mixing beeswax block baits with rodmin B because block baits are quite a common um, formulation for rodenticides in the UK um, and I wanted to try and emulate that and I exposed some snails to those block baits and I ended up using beeswax because I originally was going to try and melt down some um, non-toxic rodenticide block baits from the company Rentakill but um they didn't melt down very easily and set on fire, so that didn't work very well. Um, so I ended up using beeswax instead. Um, after they'd been exposed for a set period to those block baits, I observed the snails under UV light to see whether I could see uptake of rodman B in the tissues or on the shell or anything. Um, but there wasn't anything, I couldn't see anything. So I decided to move on and see whether I could see the rodman B uptake in hemolymph samples. So I took hemolymph samples, which is basically like um, an invertebrate version of blood. And I observed those under UV light, but I still couldn't see anything. So um, I needed to see whether it was that rodman B wasn't working in invertebrates, so I couldn't use it, or whether it was just a formulation. So I decided to try another formulation just to make sure that it was, um, that, it was that and not just that rodman B wasn't gonna work in this. So I ended up expo um, mixing the rodamine B with a paste um, formulation. 
which I managed to get from the company Rentacil, and it was um, a non-toxic paste. So it was the same rodenticide paste that they use um, in industry, just without the active rodenticide ingredient. So I mixed that with some rodmin B and exposed the snails to it. And after set periods of exposure, again, I used fluorescent detection. So I used a UV torch to see whether I could see any uptake in the snails. And it was fantastic because I could. So I've got a couple of photos here. So you could see it on the shells and you could see it um, on the bodies um, of the snails. So, so it was some um, in the tissues. It's completely temporary and completely safe. It was absolutely fine. But for a few days I had some glowing snails, which was pretty cool. But um, what was more cool was that I could then use red end, um, rhodamine B as a substitute for red end sides um, if I wanted to, because it did show up. So I measured the uptake and persistence of the rodmin B and compared it against the same values for red endocytes from a previous study in slugs. And then I compared the values to see whether it was comparable at all. And it turned out it was. So it was decided that it was a good and safe substitute for red endocytes in this study, which was brilliant. So now I knew that rodmin B was a good substitute and I could use those in the baits. The next step was to look at testing the uptake of um, those baits in a natural environment. So this took place across two main locations. The first was my main location, and that was up at Rice Home Farm in Lincoln. And I studied there between April and August of this year. And the second one was Stand Lake in Oxfordshire. And I'm actually still working there. I started in October and I should finish there in the next couple of weeks. So I've put little dots on them. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, the, they represent different habitats that I've been studying in. So the red ones are hedgerows, the blue and pink are different forest ones, so there's a pine forest and a regular forest one. The yellow are farm buildings, so I had one over at Rise Home and I had one over at Stand Lake, and then these orange ones on the Stand Lake ones are urban sites and that was really exciting actually because Rise Home's a very rural um, site so I couldn't get any urban sites over there. So it was brilliant that I could over here because obviously, as we know, hedgehogs are found in both rural and urban areas. So I wanted to be able to test both if I could. So the methodology was the same across both locations. And what I did was I set out red inside bait boxes containing this Rodamin B paste bait in all the different habitat locations that I just showed you. And I set those out and I left them for 72 hours. After that 72 hours, I opened up the boxes to see whether I could find any invertebrates in there. And any that were, I noted down and I observed them under UV light to see whether they had taken up the bait or not and recorded that. I then took the, bait, the boxes away and set up pitfall traps between zero and two meters away from where the boxes had been and left those for 24 hours. And then I checked those traps for invertebrates, which I again observed under UV light to see whether they had taken a bait or not. And that was able to show me how far any invertebrates that had consumed a bait had traveled. So that was really interesting as well. Um, as well as those, I also made a few tweaks to kind of try and get as much information as possible, because as I said, there's not a huge amount of information out there on this. So I set out some boxes that didn't have any bait in them to see whether that affected the capture rate of invertebrates, because I wanted to see whether the bait was actually attracting them or not. And I also set up some boxes with copper tape around the entrances, because copper tape is meant to repel mollusks. And I found kind of in the first few months that slugs and snails seem to quite like the um, the paste bait. So I was going to, I wanted to do that to see whether it did have any repellent properties and whether it did repel them or not. So at the moment, I'm in the process of statistically processing this data. Um, and as well as the main aim of seeing whether invertebrates do consume red endocytes or not, I will, I'm aiming to determine whether red endocyte bait uptake and the frequency of invertebrates found around the bait sites is affected by loads of different variables. So that includes environmental things like rainfall and temperature, um, things like the habitat, because I was able to sample so many different habitats and invertebrate species. And like I said in the last slide, um, presence of copper tape and the presence of bait. So I'm able to see the influence of lots of different things on it, which could be really interesting. 
So the second chapter, as I said, is looking at hedgehog diet and their exposure to rodenticide. And this has been kind of split up into a few different bits. So it starts off with a review of the available literature analysing hedgehog diet. And I'm doing that so I can compare lots of different variables across the data sets. So things like um, hedgehog sex, age, habitat, um, temperature, that sort of thing, to see if any have a significant impact on the diet of European hedgehogs. However, I almost immediately encountered quite a big problem with that, which was that when I was looking at the inverse, um, not the inverse, but sorry, the literature, the data counts differ um, quite significantly. So you've got loads of different data counts and it, it's got things like mean relative volume, the direct count, percentage of prey items and lots of other things, which makes it really difficult to compare the data because it's, there's so many different counts. However, after some searching, I managed to find quite a lot of papers that used at least one percentage occurrence. So I decided to use that for my comparison because that allowed for easy comparison between the data sets. So in order to compare the dietary data between the different studies, I built up my own data set using 11 different studies from across the, UK, the, the hedgehog geographic range. So that spans from New Zealand to the UK to Europe. And it also spans across about the last 60 years or so. So it's quite a, um, a broad range. So what I did was I read each study and extracted the percentage occurrence data and any information on temporal and bioclimatic variables, which I then put into a spreadsheet for ease of comparison. So I've put the headers here. So as you can see, I've got the percentage occurrence here, and then I've got my variables like sex, seizure, season, um, temperatures, rainfall, urban or rural habitat, that sort of thing. So it's all in one place and easy to compare. This I'm also in the process of statistically processing to see whether any of those variables has a significant impact on the hedgehog diet and the percentage occurrence of different invertebrate species in the hedgehog diet. So the next part of chapter two was to build up my own data set on UK European hedgehog diet. And I decided to look at the hedgehogs in Lincoln, which is where I'm at uni at the moment. So what I did was, I collected 26 hedgehog fecal samples from the University of Lincoln campus across um, the last summer, so summer of 2021. And I then oven dried all those samples and washed them through a collection of sieves of different sizes to collect any prey remains. And I washed them through a collection of sieves of different sizes because I needed to make sure that it wasn't biased towards one particular size of invertebrate, which would obviously be awful um, because it'd be wrong. Um, the prey remains were then viewed under a microscope and 20 photos taken of each sieve size. Um, I then looked at the photos and identified any invertebrate remains that I could. So I've put some examples on here because I just thought they were really cool. So you've got spider fang here, earthworm cheetah here, um, there's a tibia and the mandible of carabid beetles here. And then here, just this little one here is um, a mollusk gradula. So that's from a slug or a snail. So from that data, I was then able to calculate the percentage occurrence of each invertebrate species across the sample to match up with the data set that I just showed you in the last slide. So that's going to have quite a lot of potential uses. The first being that I can add it to the existing dietary data set that I showed you, and that will contribute to the analysis of the environmental variables on hedgehog diet. And that will allow me to investigate which environmental variables affect diet and so affect exposure to hedgehogs through secondary poisoning, because if um, if a particular environmental variable has hedgehogs eating more of an invertebrate that I found in chapter one to consume rodenticides, that population is obviously more likely to be exposed to rodenticides if they are around them. Additionally, I'm going to be able to collate this data with the data from chapter one to calculate toxicity exposure ratios. And that will allow me to, to estimate the exposure of Lincoln's hedgehogs to rodenticides through their consumption of the tested invertebrates. And that was another reason for carrying out my own data collection actually on diet, um, because the data from the UK is all relatively old. Um, I thought it'd be useful to have a new data set because diet 
might have changed over the last few decades. So if I were to use the available UK data to estimate toxicity exposure ratios, they, I mean, it might not be, but there is a chance that it might be out of date, which, so it wouldn't be very good for conservation efforts in conserving the current populations. So I wanted to make sure that was all up to date. So a few things I have to do. The first is to finish off my field work, which hopefully should be next week. Then I need to finish processing stats from the field work and the dietary review and finish calculating my toxicity exposure ratios. And finally, I need to finish writing my discussion and sit for my viva. And then hopefully by the end of January, it'll all be sorted. So in summary, this study is hopefully gonna provide new information on this under-research pathway of rodenticide exposure in European hedgehogs, which is secondary poisoning. And this will include whether invertebrates consume rodenticides or not, how frequently rodenticide consuming invertebrates are ingested by hedgehogs and any environmental influences on that. And finally, the extent of rodenticide exposure that European hedgehogs suffer through invertebrate intake. And that'll hopefully help to generate an enhanced understanding of the ecology of this species, which with the UK hedgehog population and other hedgehog populations in quite worrying decline will hopefully prove valuable and help to aid conservation efforts in the future. Thank you for listening. Any questions? I'll just stop sharing if That's I amazing. can. Thank you very much, Emily. That's that was um, that was really really interesting. I think we'll all be um, waiting with bated breath to see uh, what the re the results of your research are when when you when you've collated all the statistics. I, ooh, excuse me. I don't think we've got any questions in the chat box. Just some chat going on, really. Um, some uh, people. I think it might have been might have been the one and only Alex saying um, that those uh, samples, those examples, were really interesting. Um, and we had some chat um, from. Um, from Alan actually at the beginning um, it's a reasonable assumption that um, oh no sorry that's a different question uh, at most pest controllers know um, that lots of mollusks go into bait boxes because they can see the slime trails but I think what you've got and done is that sort of step step above isn't it and, and look to see whether they're making up a, a, a big proportion of the hedgehog's diet um, so we'll wait to see what, what the, um, the results are there but yes no no questions specifically in the chat box for you and um, we'll take a okay. quick We'll take a quick break. Um, so if we can just take a five minute break and we'll be back for quarter past, we have one final talk uh, and then we'll wrap up um, for uh, for the day. And um, we will be done by four, if not a little bit before. So not too much longer to go if you can hang by it. So we'll take a little break and we'll have you back at um, quarter past. So just a quick one. Thanks so much, Emily. Great, so welcome back everyone. Um, we are on to our last talk of the day. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to um, grab a drink for comfort break. Um, uh, and as it says on the screen here, we're, we're due to finish this talk around quarter to four and then we'll have some just chance to wrap up and ask any final questions. Um, so that's how we're looking for the rest of the afternoon. So our last and final talk is from Kevin Newell. Um, uh, and Kevin Newell is from the Humane Wildlife Solutions um, a charity or business, I think. Um, and Kevin's going to be talking about the non-lethal approach to rat conflicts, which I think we're all really looking forward to. Kevin's the owner and founder of the multi-award winning wildlife control business, hum Humane Wildlife Solutions, who specialise in helping clients to both domestic and commercial with wildlife conflicts without using uh, lethal traps or poisons. Kevin's approach has helped lots of clients overcome rat conflicts. And today Kevin's going to explain the approach and why, um, why it's important. Um, so, hi, Kevin. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> right. I'll, um, I'll just get my uh, screen shared. Uh, firstly, thanks, Joe, for inviting me uh, to talk here today. And um, hopefully uh, you all will enjoy uh, my presentation. So I'll just start off with a um, brief introduction. Um, so my talk is titled An Unlethal Approach to Rat Control. Um, so who am I? Um, I'm just going to run through this really briefly. I'm Kevin, founder of uh, um, Humane Wildlife Solutions, multi-award winning these days. Um, I have a lot of awards this year for all the work we've been doing. Um, formed in 2012 and, um, you know, we, we offer a completely non-lethal, ethical, environmentally friendly um, 
vegan approach, I guess, uh, to um, wildlife conflicts. And that was based on um, my own personal um, views, I guess. Um, I've been a vegan over 21 years, uh, and that's heavily influenced the way I run the business. Um, I had a really good mentor uh, called John Bryan. Uh, sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, John was at the forefront in coming up with ideas of how to approach wildlife conflicts without causing harm. And I was very um, lucky to have him teach me um, some of the things he knew. And I built upon that over these last nine years uh, to where we are now. And I'll be honest, when I first started, even my family and my friends laughed and joked at how I was going to humanely uh, deal with rats. Uh, but you know what? I found a way uh, and it works really, really well. Um, I work not just with rats, I work with all different species um, and I do global consultations uh, all over the world. So I've done from wolves in Canada, baboons in South Africa, rats up the Nepalese mountains in a, in a uh, Buddhist monastery, um, right from all over Europe with just a vast array of species. So um, it's not just rats I work with, but rats... Um, are one of the species I really enjoy working with because they're so intelligent. They prove a tough challenge and they keep me on my toes. Um, I don't see rats as the same negative way as, as many people do. Um, by working, I say, with them um, in trying to encourage them to move along, I see how um, super intelligent they are. And not just that, I see uh, just how social and sentient they are as, as fellow earthlings, I guess, because we all share this planet together. It's not just an earth made for humans, it's a, an earth made for all the earthlings, all the living creatures that live on it, and the rats are one of them. Um, and they deserve to be around us as much as we do. Um, so yeah, every time I work with rats, I know I'm gonna be in for a tough day, um, but that makes my job even more fun, uh, trying to understand the psychology and behavior of these, these creatures even more. So for the work I've done, I've been uh, I've had quite a few awards. I had a Food and Drink Awards, um, Best Pest Control Service in Scotland, uh, Scottish Pest Control Service of the Year, Goody Awards and Global Vegan Wildlife Business Awards. Um, didn't know any of these were coming. They always came out the blue. Um, it seems a lot of people follow the work I do uh, because we're so unique. I believe we're the only type of company doing this in Europe, possibly the world. Um, when you extend what we do to insects and we we do non-lethal work, you know, everything from wasps to ants to silverfish um, to a whole variety of uh, creatures and every single case will never harm or kill or destroy or use anything that would, would harm them or harm the environment they, they live in. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been nice to have the work that I do recognised and given these awards. So rats, um, they are a pest to some. Um, and it, as, as the, the previous talkers have mentioned, you know, they have been blamed for almost everything through history. Um, they get such a bad press. Um, but, you know, I don't think they really deserve that, that, that bad press. Um, they, they live amongst us, uh, whether there's rats with six feet of this or 90 meters, uh, see all the, the, the different um, theories out there, they do live. Um, amongst our towns and cities and our rural areas. And, you know, they're allowed to. It's a, they're the part now of a natural ecosystem um, and they should be penalised for, you know, living in the outdoor spaces. I agree with most people. You don't want them in your house. Um, but, you know, they, they sometimes get, do get into properties and they can be tricky and destructive. Uh, but there are ways, and I'll go into those shortly, to encourage them out of houses. It's never easy, it's never one quick uh, trick, it's always a process. Um, you know, you'll be surprised, a lot of people actually enjoy having rats in their gardens and, and people do encourage them and feed them. Um, I don't mind people having rats in their garden, uh, but I would never say to feed them. Even if you love your rats, I would never say to feed them. Rats are notorious for breeding to their food source, so if you give rats plenty of food, you can end up with plenty of rats. Um, so, you know, if you've got rats in the garden and they're there naturally, and there's a natural food uh, balance, uh, as to say, to support them, then let them be at that level because they're never going to breed more than they can um, uh, feed themselves. 
Um, so we'll, we'll move on and see um, some of the, the, the scary, misleading media stories. And, um, you know, this was picked up by David um, Wembridge in the first uh, chat or presentation that was uh, had today. You know, the millions of starving giant rats, which I'll be honest, I've not found any yet, or invading homes. Um, if you've got giant rats invading your homes, then your home can't be very secure because <laughs> um, if rats can get in, you, you need to maybe uh, work on the maintenance of your home a little bit. But starving giant rats, just not a thing, not come across any in the years I've worked with them anyway. Um, you know, they got immune to pest control, Brit face explosion next year as, as rats. Again, these, these things, they're not really, I mean, there are some truths in it, but as the media love to do, they'll take a, a snippet of truth and make it into a lovely um, story to help them sell their papers. And the summer of cannibal uh, rats, hungry, aggressive, highly fertile and coming to our homes. Well, I think every species on the planet um, can probably go <laughs> under any of those titles, um, but I don't think the summer of cannibal rats is a, is a useful headline and it's just done there for scaremongering sadly. So working with rats. Um, I've worked with rats over years and it's taught me how clever and resourceful they can be. Like I said earlier, they're one of the species which I know when I'm working with is going to be a tough day for me. And the way I work with them, so I, I don't use poisons, I don't use kill traps, I don't use any of that. I, I, I try to understand how they think, how they behave, what's drawing rats into these um, areas. So whether it's into a campus uh, garden area, outdoor space, or whether it's into someone's house, you know, what's, what's driving them in, what attracts them in. And then you need to understand all this because it all forms the pieces of the puzzle. And once you can understand why that rat's behaving the way it is, why it's causing a conflict uh, in the situation it's causing a conflict in, you then can start figuring out how you can reverse that, push them away and uh, stop these issues um, from continuing. So like the, the, the two biggest areas where rats will, will be of conflict is in people's gardens or outdoor spaces. So it could be university campuses or inside buildings. Now, if they're in the garden or in the outside space, you know, that is fine. If you can stop them there, that's brilliant. But when they get into buildings, they can be very, very difficult to deal with um, and they can be destructive. Um, but I would argue on the point that, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I've got rats and mice, rats are disgusting creatures. Um, you know, they're actually quite clean creatures. They're, you know, one example, I was working in a, in a food warehouse and it was just one rat had uh, managed to get in the building and set up residence. And there's a big rectangle warehouse. The rat made a nest in one corner. He did all these droppings in the two furthest corners and he stored his food supplies in the other corner. And uh, this rat and other, other rats I've, I've, I've worked with over the years all display this where they're not actually um, crossing all these um, different um, things, uh, you know, not crossing their, their food and their, their bedding and, um, their, 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 their nest sites, as to say. Um, so in this case, you know, I, I would say they're quite clean and tidy. Um, so just a quick, a quick apologies for noise in the background. It is my birds. They're, they're bouncing around my office, having a fun time. So um, I do apologize if, if you can hear that. So rats in our buildings. Rats can be troublesome and they can be hard to get out. But understanding the whole situation is key to any rat issue. So we'll do buildings and then we'll do the outside spaces for campuses. So it, the, the key thing to know is when you've got rats in a building, you need to identify how they're getting in. It's so vital to understand, you know, how they're getting into a building and then, then making sure that you can mitigate against them getting back in again, because you don't want them to keep on coming in. Because many people I've, I've, I've worked for over the years, my clients have told me, you know, an example of a job I did just over two months ago, the client had had rats, they've been putting poison down for two years, and the rats had just been constant, the, the poison been eating, the rats were still there. Uh, we went there, we, we started doing some of our work, and these rats were coming from the outside, coming into, into the property and raiding the client's kitchen. 
Um, so what we did, um, we found out their entry point and we managed to um, stop their entry point when, when the rats are outside. Uh, we had, had a, a really clever device. So um, there's a company in America who makes these one-way doors for rats, um, which is, you know, equivalent of a, of a, a cat flap for a rat, um, which I think is fantastic. Uh, and in this case, you know, they, they can go in that building and, and fit in these devices means anything is inside will find their way back out again. Um, the property is now secure. And, it's, you know, it's not just my clients, but it's their neighbours too, which now have um, property security with these rats no longer coming in. So finding that entry point is key. Um, and, you know, rats will explore little holes and they will explore any gaps into buildings. You know, they, 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 they are quite scared of, of, of new things in their environment, but they will spread out and, and search new places, especially if in the outside they've been disturbed. So if there's renovations going on, a building's been knocked down, someone's having a garden all done and there's rats in those environments, they will travel um, to find new areas. And also if those food sources in those environments are gone, they will also travel again um, to new areas. And if they find a gaping hole in your air vent or in a wall or in a basement of a property, they're gonna move in pretty quick um, and they're gonna um, take over uh, that area, uh, that area and, and move themselves in. So with rats, you need to establish firstly whether they're living in the building or just visiting. It's, I'd say probably about 50, 50 in all the jobs I've done. Uh, and I've done hundreds and hundreds of rat jobs over the last nine years. And they're never the same. There's never a set template for dealing with rats because every situation is different. From a, um, a job that I was doing in Edinburgh, uh, the two bungalows joined together. My clients had rats in their attic and they had rats in their shed. Um, after a lot of investigation uh, and hands-on assessment, so, so when I go and do these jobs, I'm really good at tracking where, where they're going, where they're moving through, um, the, the little telltale signs they leave behind that I can pick up on. So these rats initially lived in my client's shed. They moved from the shed to the neighbouring garden, went up their tree, initially to get apples. When the apples were no longer there, they started searching further up the, the tree and it led them onto the flat roof, which led them into um, the attic space. Now, these rats obviously could smell my client's rats. They, they had pet rats and they had quite a few. And the rat had actually gone. So it started out in the shed, up for the tree, under the roof, for the attic space and the neighbours, now down into my client's attic space and chewed actually through into the cupboard of the room where the domestic rats are being kept. So, you know, that was a one I, I've never come across before, but it, these rats were living outside and traveling on inside. So it's, it's really important to know when you're dealing with rats, you know, what they're doing, what, what's the attraction for them to come in, um, and then figuring out a way how you can stop that happening again. I would always say to people, and this should definitely go to all campuses and any building, even your homes, always um, go outside your property and just make sure everything's secure because there's probably going to be rats outside living somewhere. And if they're disturbed or their food source stops, they will spread out looking for a new food source. And then once they find out, they'll set up a home there. You don't want them finding, like I say, a broken air vent and moving into your home. So just go and check outside your home and just make sure nothing, you know, there's no obvious entry points that they could get in and ask your neighbors too as well, because the amount of times I've gone to clients um, and they don't have any external entry points and the rats are coming in, you know, on a terrorist, housing from two or three houses down and making their way in there so it's really important to understand um, that if you can secure your home uh, and rats don't get in in the first place that's always great keep them outside it's fine don't want them in your homes though um, when they are in homes we'll go through um, securing the building um, internally or externally it depends on every job they're so different um, in cases where rats let's say are in a house um, you know, let's say there's a, a, a detached house and you um, stop the rats getting in, uh, but now you've got rats stuck inside. You can either deploy a one-way door to let the rats out, or you can move into live trapping. Now, I always would tend to let them go first because rats will live in the walls rather than out the walls inside your, your kitchen or inside your living room or bedrooms. So it's, it's good to, if you can, seal from the inside first and then encourage them to leave. Once they don't get the food source, they will start to go on the search for more food sources. 
And it's these times you'll see more rats moving about because they are, they're desperately looking for that next food source to set up a home next to. Um, so you can, you can try and live trap them. And if you're going to, attic spaces can be good. Again, you don't want rats being up there too long because they will chew things. You don't want them chewing wires. Uh, there's many stories of rats chewing wires and, and, and buildings being burned down. So with rat problems, never leave them long. It's always worth um, trying to deal with them as quick as you can. Live catch trapping is always good. Uh, and if your home's nice and secure outside and you live in the middle of nowhere, you can just let them go in your garden. It won't apply to everyone because uh, you wouldn't be able to live catch rats in central London and let them go on the streets. There's not any suitable habitats really for them to go apart from back into buildings. Um, removal and relocation is, is really important. And we rarely have to do it, to be honest. Um, but when it does come to having to remove and relocate rodents, we always take great care on where that is. So we're looking for several things uh, as, a, as a nice release site. You need to make sure that there's no other houses nearby because you don't want to take those rats and you know pop them down a country lane which is backing onto someone's house where they may migrate towards you want to make sure they've got coverage so somewhere they are not going to get immediately predated they can hide and be safe for a little bit until they can get their bearings somewhere there's going to be potential food sources and a potential water source so woodlands with a little stream going through is good autumn time is really good because there's an abundance of natural berries and and, and foods out there for rats anyway. So, but in midwinter, it can be a little bit tougher, uh, especially if the conditions are really bad, we would usually say not to live uh, trap if, if you can help it, because releasing them in the middle of winter could put those rats um, in, in a bad situation, especially if there's deep snow outside. So rats in our gardens or outside spaces. So they do occur naturally outside and they're okay for them to be there. Uh, if you know you've got rats in your garden, uh, let's say you're one of these people who love to feed your rats in the garden. Again, that's fine. But when you use your garden, if you're going to be doing gardening or you're going to be turning over your compost or you've got a, a pond that you're um, getting weed out of or anything like that, and you know rats are using that same space, always just make sure basic hygiene, clean your hands, any cuts, give them a clean make sure you look after yourself so just be aware that if you're living with rats in your garden and you're sharing that space that you're taking the precautions to keep yourself safe I mean they are okay to to be there um, also one of the things you really want to focus on is if you've got rats in the garden you don't mind in there again just make sure that your home is secure because the last thing you want them to do is move them from your garden into uh into your house so it's very very important to make sure you go around the outside of your property and any, anywhere that the wall is um, has, has, uh, has something in between. So it could be uh, a window, a door, air vents, pipes that come out. Anywhere that wall is compromised, you need to check around to make sure you can make sure rats can't get in there. So common issues in out, outdoor spaces will be around bird feeders or chicken coops or anywhere there's a, a good food source that rats can get established. So I get a lot of people contact me with um, rats being outside because of feeding. And I'm just in the process of working with um, a local authority in England. They've got a lovely big park um, and there's a huge pond and people go there and they feed the birds everywhere around this huge pond. It's a, a big local attraction. Well, this has encouraged rats to expand in number all around this pond. And um, they, have a bit, they have a big problem. And they called me out because they wanted to look at a different alternative. Now, when I met the park ranger, I had a really interesting discussion. His words to me, for seven years, we've been using poisons, and this is the highest amount of rats we've ever had. And I asked if people have been feeding the rats more. And he said they had done. But one of the things is he said, we just need to use more poison. Until I pointed out to uh, the, the, the park ranger that if you've been using poisons for seven years and the rats are the highest level they are now, what's happening it took him a while to click but then he did agree and and he saw my point that the poisoning in this situation was not working for them so what we come up with as a plan for this site was instead of people feeding the birds everywhere was that they're now going to look into having a set feeding area where members of the public can go you know, and feed the birds so all the feedings congregate in one area what this will do straight away 
is limit and restrict the food sources to the rats around the edges. And then the only place the rats can go from there is the big fowl bed right next to where this feeding station is going to be. And what we've done to mitigate the rats moving in there is we're underlying the flower bed with thin mesh so the plants can grow into the mesh, but the rats can't dig in and get established. If the rats can't get established close to that food source, then they're most likely not going to be living in those areas anymore. And they're, they're all around the neighbourhood anyway, but these rats will have to disperse and um, find somewhere else to go. Um, but that's a, a, an easy fix for them. Um, but we have advised that they do contact the people living around to make sure their houses are secure, just so the rats don't move into other buildings, even though we, we have been told they are in all the buildings anyway, because the population has expanded to, to the feeding in the park. Um, other areas where you can see um, rats occurring is where people have outdoor animals, so that could be rabbits or chickens. And chicken coops are, are really common places for, for rats to be. I've, I've seen many a, a chicken eat young rats. Um, not all chickens will. Uh, but then again, it's just making sure that you put a plan in place. And again, we do this regularly. Um, and each plan is so different and it depends on the situation. So I couldn't really give you a template on how to deal with that. But it's about restricting the food sources and basically teaching your chickens to that food time is at certain times. Uh, so the food is limited down for limited periods of time. So where can this be applied to campuses. So if you've not got rats outside and your buildings are nice and secure and you're not feeding any uh, animals outside, then does the campus really need to have um, a poison um, program in place? Uh, you can monitor the situations to make sure that there's, there's not a huge abundance of them, but you can also limit what's going to be there by making sure that human behavior doesn't attract any more in. So you can look at waste disposal. So it could just be litter bins. You can look at the waste disposal um, processes for the university. So if you can limit these two key food sources straight away, fantastic. Um, you know, you, you're cutting down any potential food supply they might have. Um, but there's always gonna be other situations that occur where rats will be around, but they're allowed to be there. Uh, and just remember, you know, as long as they don't get in our buildings and cause issues, that's fine. Um, but rats do live in many places that we probably walk every day and you won't even know they're there and they don't cause you any issues. Um, so non-lethal methods matter. Now, it's not just because I love rats and obviously rats harm. I love all wildlife. Uh, so I would never <laughs> use poisons because we know they have an adverse effect. Now, the decades... Uh, poisons have been used to wage war against wild, not just rats, but other wildlife. And as the previous speakers have discussed, you know, there's a lot of non-target species um, crossover here and high risk to wildlife. And I have to question that if, you know, um, I believe, sorry, it was uh, um, Dr. David Buckle was saying um, that, you know, the current position mitigation is not preventing widespread wildlife exposure. If current processes are not protecting our wildlife should we be poisoning at all i don't think so because you know we we are in a uh, an environmental and wildlife crisis at the moment and poisons will be adding to that uh, and i know cases where um poisons has affected not just wild animals but also people's pets uh this um as you can see by the bottom of my slide there the research done in netherlands by the kad um university they put bait stations with non-toxic uh, bait in there. Um, and it was just so they could study what was happening. And this is uh, a result of what visited their bait stations. Now, this was around the farm um, area, but you can see, you know, if they were going to try and poison uh, rats or, or mice, just look how many other species are visiting these, uh, these bait stations. And just think if everything there was to be consuming poisons and spreading it around the food chain and their environment, the effect that's going to have. And we saw Emily's talk about, um, you know, the uh, other invertebrates and slugs and snails. And, you know, over a quarter of, of visits to these bait stations were slugs and snails. So there is something worrying there. There is, is, is there a way, I don't know, David might be able to tell us, is there a way that you can make sure or even reduce this risk? 
Um, but if there is, it needs to be in place now because all these other species which shouldn't be affected by our poisons are being poisoned. Um, you know, and there's protected species which are being poisoned. So when does that then become willfully poisoned wildlife if, if you know that they're being affected by this? Um, I, I do think it should be it should be law or, or standard practice that pest controllers survey areas. Um, from pest controllers I spoke to, I know they don't bother. If they get told there's, there's rats, they'll put poison down outside and that's that. And they're not checking to see what other creatures are using that environment because I had a case with a city council in Scotland who were poisoning in a park um, because people were feeding the birds at this park and rats were there, but also there was water voles and other protected species there. Uh, and I, so I made that aware to the city council. They, they weren't aware that they were there, um, but I showed, uh, I showed them the um, biological data recording records for that area, and they've been there for a very long time, as well as members of the public saying, you know, we are seeing water voles, and these water voles were directly in the area where they were trying to bait and poison them. It did turn out that the person laying the poisons did think the water voles were rats and were trying to poison them, but they did pull them all back very quickly. And in this case, the city council is now moving to a situation where they're trying to control the feeding and the whereabouts of the feeding rather than trying to eradicate the wildlife in that area. So um, that's just a real brief talk. I can go on for a long, long time. I need to be better at my time keeping. So that's me finishing uh, for my chat. So if you've got any questions, um, please do ask. And I'm happy to, to answer my way. And you see there's some baby rats I was, I was working with um, and uh, a good friend of mine from Essex, Jennifer Dunn, she loves her rats and taking photos on the right hand side there. Uh, but if you've got any questions, please do ask. That was a um, really, really interesting presentation, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you ever so much for that. I think people are probably squirreling away in the background, typing out some questions, but there are a few in the chat box um, that you can address in the meantime. Um, if that's all right, we do have um, we do have a little time before we finish. Question from um, from Alan, um, Alan Buckle, um, who's asking, Alan's always been told that relocation is illegal and inhumane. Are you saying that it's legal to relocate rats? Um, it is legal to relocate rats, yeah. Um, obviously, when doing so, you do not want to be releasing them near other people's properties. So it takes a great, great, a lot of care uh, and planning if you're releasing rats. Um, I've rarely, rarely had to do it because the way we work, we never have to get to that situation. Um, but I do believe you, you, it is legal. You can relocate rats. And um, it, it can be inhumane. But Alan is right there. It can be inhumane if people, if people don't know what they're doing. So if just an everyday person had rats in their house and they put a live catch trap out and took them and, and dumped them somewhere, um, that rat could be put in a, a bad situation. But the way I work for my clients is if they need to do this, then I will um, run through with them the best places they can release animals because uh, releasing any wildlife back into the world, you know, you're taking it from an environment that it's most likely going to be thriving. You need to make sure the place you're putting it is going to be um, the safest place for that animal. Mm. Great. That's, um, that's fascinating. Thank you. We've had a, another question on the, um, on the chat box from Liz, uh, Liz Harris over at Solent University. Have you, have you had uh, much success with humane cage traps? Do rats willingly go inside them? Um, so if they're lured with things like peanut butter, etc., um, or do they have, have the sense to steer clear? <laughs> Right, okay, this is a funny one. Um, and I don't know the reason for this, but someone, I was actually speaking to, a, again, a lethal controller who actually has experienced the same over the years. So what I find with uh, with rats, you'll catch the baby rats, first of all. Um, now, when it, if you're ever using any kind of um, trap to, to try and live catch rats, and like uh, I, I believe um, uh, David Buckle said as well, uh, sorry, I think it's Alan, not David, one of the parties, Dr. Buckle said, um, but when they used um, things that was already in the environment for the rats, so if it's outside, if you use things which are in the locality of where those rats are living, they're more likely to go into the trap. And we find using rat droppings or putting live catch traps where the rat droppings are, you're more likely to, um, to encourage them to go in quicker. But you'll find it's the young rats that will go first, so they're, they're carefree and don't think about what they're doing. 
then you'll catch the male rats because they're intelligent, but they're not as intelligent as the female rats. They are one of the hardest um, <laughs> of the rats to catch. Catching a female rat is, is extremely hard because they're so, so super intelligent. I don't know why the, 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 the male rats are easier than catching female rats, um, but it's something I noticed and even a, a lethal pest control has even corroborated that with his experiences that um, it can be hard to catch, but it, it's about knowing what they're going for. So if you're trying to live catch rats, which are let's say feeding off fat balls from a bird feeder, you're not going to go and bait that rat that rat trap with uh, peanut butter or, or cheese or things like that. You're going to bait it with what? Offering that certain food source in a slightly easier scenario, you're more likely to catch them. But failing to that, um, you can use Nutella or Vigo spread. Uh, a chocolatey spread is always good um, uh, to, to, to get them in. So chocolates and nuts together, peanut butter. Yep, Nutella, Vigo, uh, and you'll catch them quite easy. Fascinating. With the exception of um, fat balls, they've got a similar taste in food to me. <laughs> What's, um, where are you based? Anne, Anne Marie's asking where, where it is that you're based. And she said, thank you very much for a great talk. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm just based just south of Glasgow, um, hence why I was over the COP26 uh, this morning. Uh, nice quick journey up the road, just 20 minutes away. Um, but I, I do consultations um, globally. Um, which have been really, really popular this year. Um, and I also go out um, and work across Europe uh, and the wider UK. In fact, I'm off to London tomorrow uh, for two mice jobs, no rat jobs, but two mouse jobs in the city um, and probably squeeze more while I'm there. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it, it based here, but I, I do a lot of traveling uh, because our services are, are in very high demand at the moment. Yeah, and yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that that, uh, that they are. We've actually had a question, and I know that we've been having a, um, a little a little um, side chain together about your building relationships with universities that are looking to um, more humane methods for pest control. And we've actually had another question on the chat, bo chat box from Richie over at UE, um, wanting to know if you offer your consultancy services to universities to help develop pest control strategies. <laughs> ah, I do, yes. And in fact, um... I'm already, I, I, in fact, as soon as this um, conference started earlier on today, I actually had an email from a university uh, arranging for me to consult with them about how we can look at non-lethal services for their entire campus. And that is a, a Scottish university that um, I'm going to be working with there. Um, but yes, I, I do offer uh, consultancy services. Um, I prefer being on site because um, the way I work is very thorough. I like to get down on my hands and knees and I always call it my CSI investigation of what's going on. Um, when I'm there on site, I can, I can appreciate everything that's going on, the little tracks they leave, the patterns, the holes. Uh, I see it different to other people. I see it through their, the rat's eyes. So um, being on site is better, but I can do consultation and consultancy services if, if clients prefer that method. Oh, that's great. I hope that answers your question there, Richie, um, if you'd like to get um, in touch with Kevin. Um, I'm sure we can we can pass along the contact details there. Um, so I think there's kind of a strong a strong theme from really every presentation um, that we've that we've heard today, and, and I guess this is a kind of a bit of a call, uh, almost a call to action for our universities. You know, whether you're a staff member or a student, you whether you have control over you know um, ro rodent control strategies or not that there's a clear place we should be starting with these conversations and that's to make to, to make sure that your area of campus or wherever it is 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 not is you know you've done that you've done that survey you've done that initial work to make sure that there aren't entry points for for rodents into into buildings and that that certainly sounds like something that there's information out there for you or working with your pest control contractor or even working with um businesses like kevin's and, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for the power of student voice. And if you think that there is something on your campus that needs to be changed, passing that up the chain. Um, so I would be really thankful um, if anybody um, has any questions directed at any of the speakers that haven't already been addressed and you would like them to be before we go. We do have a few final minutes now and I'd, I would welcome you to unmute your microphones instead of using the chat box if you would prefer. Um, and uh, just while we're awaiting any last questions, I wanted to say a big thank you to all of our speakers. It's been such a varied <laughs> and interesting afternoon. 
Um, and I think people will get a lot from this uh, in their you know discussions with themselves as hedgehog friendly campus teams, um, but also perhaps with um, grounds teams and pest control con contractors at the university as well. Um, so um, uh, if we do have any last questions, please feel free to, free to unmute. I can't see any more in the in the chat box. Um, and if not, I think we can we can wrap it up and leave things there. This webinar has been um, has been recorded, um, and we will be sharing the recording with everybody who signed up um, via Eventbrite after the session. And we'll be sending it to you as a YouTube link. Um, so do keep an eye out for that. We will have um, more um, conferences as part of the series this year. And we're thinking the next one might be about hedgehog rehabilitation. And um, so something very changing tact, very um, ever so slightly. Um, and we will keep you in the loop about that. And if you're interested in learning more about hedgehog friendly campus um, and getting involved uh, at your university, whether you're a staff member or a student, then please do get in touch. We don't just offer talks like this. Um, we have an online toolkit full of hedgehog friendly activities that you can get involved in on your campus, um, along with lots of training and resources to go alongside that. And thanks very much um, to the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. That's all ab available for free um, for your universities. Um, and uh, just before we wrap up, I think Richie's got a raised hand. Richie, have you got a final question before we leave? Feel free to unmute. Yeah, I just wondered, um, uh, can you hear me right? Yeah, cool. Uh, I just wondered whether um, it would be possible to get any of the um, the PowerPoint presentations, um, as well as just the video, because some of those might be quite useful to disseminate and deliver to other services within the university to help back up our own um, requirements. <laughs> um, and certainly, I can I can request that for you. I'm not sure if any of this is um, research that's currently undergoing that it, it may not be possible to share those slides. But I'll certainly ask for you and pass them along if that's uh, if that's reasonable and acceptable. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you all very much. Um, and um, we hope to see you at our next uh, set of conferences. We'll be in touch. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much, Joe. Take care.